and who are most recently Chennai. And this is Angad Singh. He's a Stanford student and basis member who's hosting us today. And um, we're excited to be here. We're on our seventh of eight days uh, touring the world. So we've been in six tech hubs, including London, Berlin, New York, Boston, <coughs> now Palo Alto today, and tomorrow in San Francisco. Then we wrap up in Napa. And so this is the last of our four workshops um, at different universities around the world. where We've had the opportunity to discuss with local angels the, uh, the Indian market and, and our vision for the future globally. So it's really exciting that all of you are here today and we're hearing from different keynote speakers, an amazing set of panelists. Um, so please stick around. We'll probably let out around five. Um, but we're starting a bit late, so take it away. Oh, well, good to see all of you. Uh, I guess I just wanted to welcome you guys. Margaret is a personal friend of mine, but I haven't seen her in a year, so good to see her. But good to see all of you, you know, the GSF people have been traveling around the world, and hope you guys have been comfortable in your travels, and welcome to Stanford and sunny California, you know. Um, personally, I'm very excited for this event because um, I actually do a lot of work with entrepreneurship on campus. I'm a junior studying design and computer science, but um, I'm also doing a research project in like global entrepreneurial ecosystems, and. My research recently has been in the last year, I've traveled to India, Berlin, Chile, and Silicon Valley, and like, I'm sort of comparing them, so very excited to hear what you guys have to offer. And uh, I'm happy that all of you, the rest of the people from the area, have made it out today, and hope you have a good time at Stanford. So before we start, before Rajesh comes, let's to get a sense of who's here today, raise your hand if you are currently living in India. Wow. Wow. Welcome. <laughs> Raise your hand if you currently live in either San Francisco or the Valley. So the majority of them, not by much. Raise your hand if you are a, currently a founder. About half. And, sound, and an investor? Quarter or so. And the fourth supportive in some ways. Raise your hand if you're running an accelerator or a company builder. So. If the GSF people can just raise both hands, anybody on the GSF core team? So this is Rajesh, he's the founder, that's Bridge. His role is changing all the time. We change our titles at the bottom of our email signatures, which some of you might have caught on to. And that's Bob in there. Um, GSF founders raise both hands. So you'll hear from them in their pitches a little bit more uh, further into the program. Um, we also have startups from Singularity University. Are, are you guys here right now? Have a nice time. And you'll hear from them later. So great. So hopefully you have a sense of the fractions in the room and you'll get chances to speak to each other after the program. Cool. So let's introduce Rajesh, the founder of GSF, to introduce the whole program. Come on. Yeah, okay. So I've got about 10 minutes. Um, the way I want to use these 10 minutes is to sort of share with you a story or two, maybe an anecdote here and there, and see if we can connect the dots. So first, a personal story. And uh, this is a story that happened about eight months back in London. Around the time London hosted the Olympics, and I got this invite from London government. I think that you come over, there's a closing ceremony, you are invited, very excited. And there's also this super angel conference that we're doing. We're calling these 25 people from across the world to talk and meet and see if London is a worthwhile city to invest in. So we reached there and it was a fantastic conference they put together. So we had our morning at uh, British Museum, met a few investors there, afternoon at Tate, saw Damien Hurst first time, met some startups there, then 10 Downing Street. Uh, met policy makers there and then had a great evening in East London. And in between they were taking us in buses which were facilitating communications among 25 of us. And as it happens, you know, the angels from across the world, Russia, people from the valley, a couple of them from New York, myself from India, start talking about, they talk about exits, right? who's made how much money. The one guy was talking about his exit, and he talked about his sale that he made to MIH Group. You know MIH Group? Anyone here knows Nesco as MIH? <coughs> you know, I'm surprised you don't know. South Africa. Right. So they, they made the most astutest investment in the world in a company called Tencent. 
150 million dollars is now 30 billion dollars. I think it's, it's been the smartest investment ever made in venture history, to my knowledge. So he sold his company to them, and I was talking to them that is MIH a single hit funder? It's not had that kind of hit. And next to me was this guy. His name is Joshi Bhatti, one of the smartest uh, angel investors out of Israel, was sitting there. And he's sold a lot of companies, I believe, to Cisco and Intel and stuff, right? You know that. So he's been smart, and he's a big man, right? And he's very dismissive of ordinary creatures like me. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at him and sort of was making connection with him. And I said, okay, so you've been lucky or you have a strategy? And this is an odd question to ask angel investors or any investor. And uh, the normal response, correct me, Mike, will be a bit of both, right? Is that right? So he also said, almost without thinking, bit of both. So I said, okay, bit of both. And the car moved, the bus moved on, and in about five minutes, he sort of he goes back to his slumber, and, uh, and he wakes up again. and says, actually, I've been thinking about it. I was lucky. So I step back in my mind, and sharp as I am, I said, but you've been lucky many times over. <laughs> so there must be a strategy of luck. And uh, he again dismissed me. Uh, he went off to his own mind and sleep. And just as we were about to, I think, get off at 10 Downing Street, he wakes up again and says, uh, I've been lucky because I opened my doors. Right? And it has that those words, open my doors, have stuck in my head ever since. And I think it, these words, if you start thinking about it, have many different interpretations and meaning. For us Indians, it has a much deeper meaning. Uh, we open our doors to the strangers. Uh, we open our doors on Diwali day to Lakshmi, the goddess who may visit us. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to open my doors to the smartest of Indian entrepreneurs that day. So my journey began that day. Let me talk about other sort of context of this discussion. Now let's think about reality of India. So look at we are in the Stanford vibrant, uh, one of the most vibrant student community research. Everything starts here, right, David? Am I right? We have great institutions of IITs. Many, how many of you have been to IIT? Right, many, right? And what is an IIT? IIT has become a talent factory, right? Not really a research factory, right? So our greatest institutions have just become talent factory and we're leaking talent to the world. When you start thinking about innovation, innovation system, and someone asked me here, what did I learn? I think it was Naveen who asked me. Where is Naveen? <laughs> you ask me what did I learn, I, I'll tell you what I learned, right? The smartest tech e ecosystems don't lose talent, they retain talent. That's what I learned, Lavi, right? Then I look at uh, the venture community in India. It's not had the success that it thought it would have. You invested there, right? Intel. You invested in Reader, right? Long time. Long time. The money's not been coming, right? Reader, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but on an aggregate level, it's not really performed in the way perhaps China has performed or sure. Silicon Valley has performed. Perhaps it's performed better than Europe. Perhaps. So venture ecosystem is at a stage in India where it's sort of saying, we'll primarily invest in ideas that have worked across the world and pair those ideas with smart people who can execute those ideas in India. So what it means is they're really not funding innovation at this stage. And then you look at Indian corporates, right? We hear about stories, Google buying this, there was a story in TechCrunch, Google buying these 10 engineers, Facebook buying two engineers, and endlessly buying engineers and teams, therefore giving liquidity to the system, and also uh, creating aspirations in young startups to build wealth. We don't have that. Most of our uh, big companies are very conservative by nature. They have this belief they can build almost everything. 
and the bottom fish, right? That's the reality. You all have experience. So the system is broken, if you really look at it, to really spur the innovation. So how do we do that? I'm not in the business of finishing school as some accelerator defined it. We are in the business of creating innovation. How do we create innovation in a system where almost everything is broken? Where is the hope? <coughs> so uh, the way I think about it, <coughs> sorry for the interruption. Commercial break. So where is the hope? So this is how I see the hope. Look at the world of internet today. In the last 10 years, Chinese built a market of 600 plus million internet users. Right? Why, did they, why could they do it? Because the state invested a lot of money in creating fiber of infrastructure. A lot of capital has gone into building that consumer base. We've not done that. In India, we have only 150 million users, right? In behind China. But what's changing now? I think mobile is changing. For the first time in the history of mankind, we have smartphones, smartphones which are now available, Android smart smartphones, under $100. And then in India, we have creation of uh, mobile networks, internet-enabled mobile networks, 3G, 4G, as I speak. As these two, uh, one is a global tailwind, if you look at smartphones. The prices are falling not because of Indian demand, because of global demand. The second is the function of networks in India. As you see these two forces coming together, I can easily see a market of 500 new million Indians coming and joining internet. Right? And I think that's hugely transformative. And this is going to happen in three to five years. You can be conservative and say three years, you can be aggressive and say five years, but it's inevitable. And let's look at the nature of this market creation. Nowhere else has ever been 500 million new users who will only come on internet enabled on mobile phones. So it's not just mobile first economy, it's the mobile only economy, and that to at scale. So what does that mean? Can we therefore, first time in the history of technology, create innovation out of India, around this insight that we'll get as a large consumer market? That's all. My second hope is around the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the founders that we are funding. So far, what we funded in India is the service models. And very big companies got created, if you look in the technology world, around Wipro, Infosys, around an insight that India could become the backyard and do the work for the world. But can we now build product companies? Can we now build innovation out of India? And this is how I see it. If you look at China, it's ring-fenced itself. They are creating Chinese internet. You guys are not allowed entry there. They have their own Facebook, they have their own YouTube, they have their own Baidu. We have opened ourselves to the world. Your Facebook is my Facebook, your Google is my Google. So we have the same, we are part of the same community across the world. Now, how do we create innovation around this insight? And now we already have over 250 million globally oriented Indian youth. As you know, 55% of India is below 25 years of age. Now you start combining these facts and you start to see green shoots of innovation. And that's what I'm betting my life on. A large market creation around mobile and a large youth population which is on these globally integrated platforms. Can we use these two powers to create new innovation out of India? And you have examples of some of these green shoots coming, company like InMovie, which gets only 5% of its business out of India as yet. Right. So that's what we do. We believe, uh, we hope, and we don't give up. So around this insights, we set up JSF Accelerator last year in October. We launched our first <coughs> program uh, at scale. When I was thinking about it, most of the people advised me, okay, you do a small experiment in Delhi or Bombay or Bangalore. I decided to go against all advice and said, I will launch at scale in one go. 
increasing his daily Bombay Bangalore. And that was a good decision because in one go, in three months, we created a mental network of 300 people, a brand which was uh, national. And then we created an EIR program. So as many accelerators, uh, as many companies that came through the accelerator, we also brought as many EIRs. <coughs> And that was a fantastic decision because these are the guys who run the program, right? So this year we are going to run two iterations. Uh, our second iteration is about to begin. We <coughs> announced our launch also in Chennai now. And by the end of the year we'll be running in eight cities, uh, not just in India, hopefully in some other world markets, which are which are similar in characteristics to what India is offering today, which is what frugal innovation, where unit economics of almost all transactions need to be rethought, uh, scale markets, uh, and very talent-infested markets. That's what we're looking for when we sort of think of new markets to take GSF brand. So how do we make, now third insight is, how do we make, and this is again the mean to your question, uh, in a world where innovation has been dominated by Silicon Valley. What is the hope and scope for places like Bangalore or Chennai or Delhi or Bombay to contribute innovation? And that's the question that we don't yet have an answer to, but we have a direction to See what happened to New York in the last five years. Almost nothing used to happen there. It's become a place of vibrant innovation <coughs> around certain developments and certain insights which have been captured by smart people to build a community there. Look at what's happened in Berlin. It was a dead place. Look at what's happening in London. <laughs> so my sense is that in a world uh, which is fast democratizing innovation, despite comparative advantages of Silicon Valley, there will be emergence of many web, many hubs. Each one will, in my view, will become specialized. We will move away from this era of a hub which is dominating everything to hubs which become extremely specialized. So can Bombay become specialized in becoming the media hub or fintech hub of the world? Can Bangalore become the enterprise hub of the world? Can Delhi become the <coughs> e-commerce hub of the world? I think it can. I don't know how many years will take, but I see hope. With that, I invite Naveen, who is not just given hope to the world, he's given real businesses, <coughs> transport, transformative businesses, and we want to learn from him. Over to Naveen. Thank you, Rajesh. As we can all agree, the hope is not the strategy. Right? So hoping does not get you anywhere. So let's talk about how are we going to get there. So, so my belief is really, really simple. There is no problem in the world that can't be solved through innovation and entrepreneurship. So let's talk, let's just go ahead and start talking about what is innovation, what is entrepreneurship, and how do you create large enterprises. So let me start with something, since all of you are entrepreneurs and you want to make a lot of money, let me give you a very simple answer. How do we create a one billion dollar company? Anybody knows that? Kunal say he knows the answer, but let me give it to you what the answer is. You solve a $10 billion problem. So if you want to create a billion dollar company, you go out and solve a $10 billion uh, problem and you'll create a billion dollar company. So how do you go about creating these large enterprises? In fact, it doesn't really matter what your core expertise is. And in fact, if you are an expert in the field that you're trying to go out and create a disruptive solution, you're mostly useless. So if you're an expert in your field, you're completely useless when it comes to a disruptive innovation. Most disruptive innovation comes from outside your area of expertise. And I can give you all the mumbo jumbo about how your new cortex works, but the fact is the experts are very good at two things. Telling you your idea just will not work, they have tried it before. And, and at best, they may come up with an incremental evolution. That means this is how it works, maybe you can modify it a little bit here and there. They are very good at incremental evolution. Every disruptive solution normally would come from non-experts. So when people tell you, go think outside the box, no, go think inside a different box. Right, so if you are expert in your field, take that thing, move it to a different field and apply the things. 
So today, I'm able to go out and look at the disruptive solutions where I have absolutely no expertise in. And because that's what makes me an expert on those fields. So when you go out and ask an educator, how do you solve the problem regarding education system? Every educator will tell you, our education system is broken. And I tell them, they are completely wrong. Our education system is not broken. Our education system is simply obsolete. When it's obsolete, what you do? You reinvent it. You can't take your old start Motorola StarTech phone and make it an iPhone. It is an obsolete phone. It's an obsolete education system. Education system actually is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It was designed to do is to uh, actually create in the manufacturing era the plug and play devices. That means human beings, it didn't matter whether it was Steven or Tim, as long as somebody had this expertise, you can take one and put the next piece in. So it was designed for an industrial era. So there are a couple of interesting things that happened there. In the manufacturing process, you want to make sure that you take the certain raw, raw goods, you put them in the beginning of the assembly line, and you're hoping that they are kind of the same type of things, right? And then you move them from station to station, you do very small work on each station, and you move them on assembly line. We do exactly the same thing for our, with our children. We group them by their date of manufacturing. How old are you? Nine year old, you go here. 10 year old, you go here. 11 year old, you go here. And then you take them from station to station. History here, the geography here, and the math there. And you're hoping at the end, somehow you do the standardized testing and to pass fail and you get the thing out to the manufacturing. That's exactly what we do. The fact is, that system worked really, really well when you could educate the children, teach them certain skills, and those skills could be used for the rest of their life, and the education system worked great. What's really happening now is, we have exponentially growing technology. Every single skill that you learn becomes obsolete in five to 10 years. So it doesn't matter what you learn. By the time you get to be a productive citizen of the society, those skills are obsolete. So what do you do? You learn to learn. You learn to reason. And then you have to go back and say, what is it about the human brain? How do we actually learn? And I can spend all this time telling you about how does the human brain works? How does the human brain reasons? How does how education system actually kills the creativity? Imagine a person when they are young, you can ask them a question, they can tell you 10 different ways of solving the problem or 10 different answers to the same question. By the time you graduate from college, you have been told, if you can think of two right answers, one of them is wrong, get the right one. And don't talk to anybody, that's called cheating, right? In the real world, what do we do? We collaborate. We get people's ideas, and there are more than one way of doing the same thing. So we don't say, oh, my way is the only right way, and your way has to be wrong because mine is right. There could be more than one way of doing the right things, right? So the thing is, what do we do? So you can come up with a completely disruptive way of education. That's a hundred billion dollar market. In fact, I would call it, that's a trillion dollar market. So if you guys want to go out and create dis disruptive innovation, Think about creating, not the MOOCs. MOOCs are, you know, come and gone. So MOOCs are these massive online open courses. They are fundamentally a massive change from the universities that you see here. So when you see in 20 or 30 years or 40 years from now, that universities like Stanford or Harvard or Princeton, they won't exist. And their competition is not the other great universities like Wharton or Yale or anybody else. Their competition is going to come from totally disruptive ideas, and people thought that could be a mass online courses. You know, that is a great beginning. But what's really happening in the online courses is it is the first generation of television. In the first generation of television, you had a video camera in front of a radio jockey, and we call that a television. Until people came about and start taking advantage of the media. So what would that happen in the education system? The education system will become adaptive. That means as opposed to the children adapting to how teacher teaches, the teacher or the software will adapt to how you learn. It will automatically, will not only teach you the way you learn, it will learn from you because you learn a lot more by teaching. And I can go on and give you a whole bunch of things how you could go about doing it. What if you are able to come up with a neural feedback? So ultimately what will happen will be, you will have a neural feedback devices, you'll be able to see when you're losing the focus, when you're no longer paying the attention. 
you will be able to modify your own brain because even though you were told when we were young that every single child, every one of us is born with a fixed number of neurons. They are fixed. God gave those genes to you. Those are your neurons. It turns out they were all wrong. <coughs> Our brain actually has a substantial neuroplasticity. And through that neuroplasticity, you can fundamentally change every piece of your brain. Whether it's a short-term memory, the long-term memory, the episodic memory, or a declarative memory, you can change the executive decision-making. You can change the decision-making of how you make decisions. In fact, every single nightmare that parents face is that children are playing the video games. It turns out playing the first-person shooting game where you're shooting people, that is the best thing for a child in terms of decision-making, executive functions, and peripheral vision. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's move on to the next billion dollar industry. So let me tell you what are the, you know, if you ask me where are the trillion dollar industries that are going to be created, education is one of them. The next big industry is going to be created is going to be in the area of um, healthcare. The massive disruption is going to come in the healthcare diagnostic and the healthcare cure. So healthcare diagnostic, I'm telling you it's only a matter of time where you're going to have a 20 or $10 tablet device connected to a five cent sensor that will be able to diagnose the most common diseases better than any physician. You'll be able to diagnose whether you have a dengue fever or influenza or malaria or any other disease better than most doctors can ever do. Because these microfluidic chips are already in play. In fact, I was in Bangalore a couple of years ago and I saw these devices that are five cent chips. You could spit on them, you could drop a drop, drop of blood, and they're able to diagnose 100 most common diseases right from there. As you know, I'm on the board of XPRIZE. We have a tricorder device that we're launching a $10 million prize for somebody to come up with a single chip or a single device on a mobile computer that are able to diagnose the common 100 diseases. That's a $10 million right there for you. Ultimately, the biggest change is going to come in terms of the healthcare cure. Every company who is a pharmaceutical company, if you are a Merck CEO, you wonder what is Pfizer doing? Maybe they have up some, something up their sleeve because we are getting, we are getting our lunch eating. And if you are really forward looking CEO of a pharmaceutical company, maybe you think somewhere along the line there is some biotech companies that are doing some interesting work. It turns out the disruption is not going to come from any one of those industries. Once you start to sequence your genome, epigenome, microbiome, and proteome, it is simply becomes a big data problem. And your competition is going to come from Google, some Microsoft, or some <coughs> big data analytics guy. Because you'll be able to not only find the correlation, you'll be able to find the causation. So if you're looking to do the thing, this is fundamentally a big data problem. And ultimately, that's where the healthcare queue is going to go. It's going to get personalized. Every single medicine is going to get personalized to you. And that's why I'm an absolutely firm believer is in the next five to 10 years, the problem around cancer will be cured. Because once you have made the shift from that all cancers are same, just because you have a cancer in the liver, doesn't mean you have a liver cancer, you have a cancer in the liver. That's it. And that those cancers are not the same. That means you're able to now use the nanotechnology to deliver a specific device to a specific tumor with a specific uh, uh, a molecule that binds to that specific protein in that tumor in your body, not in somebody else's body. And you'll be able to deliver that drug and actually kill that thing. <coughs> Third big industry is going to be in the space exploration. Our society is going to continue to go find a new, um, new exploration areas. As human beings, we are explorers. And there is no reason if we can explore the continents, seven continents, Antarctica and anything, there is no reason we couldn't be exploring the moon and the Mars as a private companies. And I'm telling you, the time has come. You'll start to see in the next 10 years, there's going to be a fundamental <coughs> shift where the individual entrepreneurs are going to be able to do things that only governments could do before. In fact, even the governments hasn't been able to do that before. Only two countries that have ever landed on the moon. And I have another company called Moon Express that essentially we're building the lunar lander to go to the moon and bring the resources back from moon to Earth. A, a person who grew up in a village in India with no food to eat, if that person can dream about going to moon and bring the things back from moon to Earth, there's nothing that you can't do. There's absolutely nothing you can't do in this world. So if you can dream about it, you can do it. And if there is any problem that you think is unsolvable, think about what innovation that exists and apply the entrepreneurial skill. So I'm going to end with one thing. 
let me tell you the entrepreneurship is not about starting a company. Entrepreneurship is about state of mind. What's the state of mind? <laughs> when you see a problem, how many of you can see the problems around the world? Most of you, you know why? Because we're all human beings, we call them human beings. We all see the problem. Some of us who can also find a solution to those problems, those people are visionaries. They're the only one type of people in the world who go out and do something about it. They solve the problem. So entrepreneurs are the problem solvers. The day you start to think about solving a problem, you become an entrepreneur, whether you're inside the company, outside the company, whether you start the company, don't start the company. So go out there, solve big problems. You will create billions of dollars in industry by solving very, very large problems. So there is absolutely nothing you can do. And with that, I want to say thank you. It's a perfect note to start our panel. So Rajesh will moderate, and other guests, please come up to the four chairs here. We'll add a bit. All the panelists, please. If we don't have mics, we just speak loudly. Can you guys move in the chair? Make space for General partner, um, just give you an overview. We're 25 years in the venture business, started in the 80s. Um, we have nine venture funds, about 3.4 billion under management. We open it off, we have offices here in New York, Westport, Connecticut, Herzliya, and outside of Delhi, think are gone. And um, we opened our office in India five, six years ago, I guess now. Um, and I would tell you that the contrast, we saw it like a lot of people in the Valley, a lot of our engineering teams were outsourcing engineering work to India. And that's where the first sort of shaking of the tree of something's happening in India. And uh, we followed that closely. We did a company called E4E, uh, which maybe many of you might know. And that kind of dipped our toe in the water in India. And then from that, we eventually started looking to open an office there. And um, we have a number of people on the, on the street there. And, um, I would say the contrast is when we went there is that the Indian entrepreneurial market is very much like, in many ways, the way the U.S. market was back in the 80s. You have to spell venture capital for people, you have to explain what term sheets are all about, why are these guys taking our money, what about options, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk about is the beginning, getting kind of your training wheels on how to build anything. I mean, the conversations we had about how much stock to give people, should we give stock to people, um, very similar, a lot of investment bankers running around um, <coughs> providing deals to try to get a network going. It is just the, you know, sort of the beginning of that, that process and very analogous to what we saw in Boston and Silicon Valley back in the 80s when we started having this, this thing called, you know, venture capital get established. So it, it's in its nascent levels and I'd say through the last, you know, half a dozen years, you've had some uh, companies like Make My Trip come out of this process, I think people know in the U.S. But there's been a lot of Indian companies that have done well. Um, not, it's not as fast. People thought India was going to turn into China. Uh, it hasn't been quite that, that same uh, road to success. But nonetheless, we're seeing a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest. There's an infrastructure there. There's a thirst to try to succeed. Um, and that is all very positive for us. And so uh, 
you know, it is still emerging. It's, it's a growing market. Um, we believe they have to be at the ground floor of this to help uh, the Indian venture market get going, and there's no better way to do it than having done it before. So we've sort of done it here. Let's go there and apply the same rules. <coughs> so our, some people went there and decided to do buyouts. They decided to invest in auto parts or whatever. You know, we are sticking exactly to what we do here. It's got to be tech startups. You got to be involved early, and they have to have going after a big problem. As Naveen said, you know, make a big company, solve a big problem. And, um, and the common thing is, which you find a lot of the foreign uh, countries, and Israel is also very prolific, as you know, in, in uh, entrepreneurship, is I think people get a little too close to home about the problem solving. And they need, you really do need to step back and think about what problem you're solving. Because it may be, I can, you know, every day there's a million things you can solve, but is it worth solving? And I think that's where the good news is the internet, video, uh, communications, Facebook. I mean, something can happen here, and in one second off your phone, it's in India. So the good news is the information flow is now free. And I think that's the thing you have to embrace. So not just things that are for India. Some of our companies are Indian only, Barat Matrimony, uh, which got uh, an award just a couple weeks ago um, in the matchmaking space, obviously, to. Um, you know, having sort of this information flow be more re real time. And I think if we foster that, you can learn from these other areas. Because I, I think most companies typically start global. Whether it starts here, or starts there, or starts in Israel, we're thinking global right out of the box pretty quickly. Um, and how are you going to get there? So I think we have to think along those lines. But India has Indian only companies, and India also has the BPO, things that are coming back to the US. Um, we have a company, Netflix, that's doing legal outsourcing and doing quite well. Um, and they've managed that business model. Happiest Minds, uh, Paul Dashuk, who did MindTree, he was at uh, Wipro, you know, we were following him. So both models can work. Great. So, Samir, you built a company in India and you have a few founders who give an exit to the investors. Right. In two minutes, give an overview of what did it take to build a company at scale and how did you get lucky? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I think I always preface it with the fact that. Clover? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, I think we're still at the stage right now where, where luck is playing a significant role in that, and, and predominantly the reason for that is that the market still, the ecosystem is maturing, the market is maturing. How we got lucky, I think, is uh, I, I won't really talk about how we got lucky because that. Uh, but I think the challenge about scaling companies in India still is that we've talked about that you can scale users. But it's still very, very challenging to scale a company at revenue. Uh, and as a result of that, everything that you do kind of seems inconsequential in the grand scheme of the global setup. And so, uh, and I think that's a function of, uh, uh, that's, that's a problem that's getting sol solved by itself. If you just take the mobile ecosystem, because that's probably one of the most interesting and sort of exploding sectors in the country. Uh, at 100 million monthly active users now on the mobile internet, uh, flip it around, that's still out of 900 million people. This is my good time. Thank you. This is, this is the way Sikh community in India works. <laughs> 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 Anyway, so getting back, so I think uh, that scaling has been a challenge. That was one of our biggest challenges was to, uh, was for all the hard work that we we're doing, I think our input to output, if we were doing the same thing in the valley, would have been completely different. But we wanted to sort of stick to our guns and build a company out of India. Uh, that's now happening. Uh, 18 months ago, if we thought of delaying our plan uh, by six to eight months, six to nine months, it didn't really matter because the, the mobile internet and the consumer base was pretty much where it was when you left it. Now I would worry about delaying something that I would want to launch, and I am back in startup mode uh, by six to nine months because I think the opportunity is, is scaling rapidly and it's important to get out there quickly. Can so, tell me, is it as ferociously <coughs> competitive as it is in the valley? And in China, I hear it's like the competition is so ferocious, right? Yeah. Do you, uh, do you get that sense, or you think it's still relaxed? I think when you put it the whole thing into perspective, so in terms of absolute number of companies doing stuff, probably not. When you put that into the perspective of how you have to operate, and I think people are probably familiar with, there are issues. It's far easier to set up over here. It's far easier to raise angel money here. It's far easier to get access to mentors and to just do business. You know, engaging with your, your network, uh, payment systems, basic nuts and bolts stuff is so much harder to do in India. So when you put that into perspective, uh, it, it makes life a lot harder, and therefore, by you know definition, it's more competitive. 
you got to focus on a lot more than nut, nuts and bolts that you can take for granted when you're launching the West. So it's certainly harder to do uh, in India than here, but I, I guess that's 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 getting sorted out now. Great. So I'll move to David. We had a, this telephone call. This <coughs> got a sense that uh, not only you have a unique business of early stage investing across borders in different markets. I sense a bit of enthusiasm in your voice about investing in India. Where is it coming from? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's very nice to be here. First, I'd like to recognize my colleague, Ankur Jain. Um, he, he's responsible. Good things come out of <laughs> India. <laughs> um, I'll start with my first trip to India, and it's a bit of a personal story, and I'll try and give it quick. I was invited by some of the great Silicon Valley giants, uh, Sabur Bhatia, Suhas Patil, Kanwal Rekhi, to go on a Thai mission to meet with the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister and the Telecoms Minister in India back around 99 or 2000. And I said, why me? <laughs> I'm this little Jewish kid from San Francisco. I've never been to India except for the backpack and, you know, I, I, I don't know what, why you want me to come. And he said, we want you to tell the story of your U.S. investments in Israel and how them with the same colonial background of British overlords, throwing that off, having a socialist background, then becoming an IP-centric country, has done so well with enemies all around, et cetera, et cetera. And we think that India has some similarities there that are relevant uh, to share with our, our ministers. So I went on this tour, and this tour, not just because of me, but mainly because of them, was incredibly successful. And the main thing that those people said is, I think Naveen said it beautifully, you know, I was a poor peasant kid from a, a village in India and I came to Silicon Valley and I became a billionaire. And I, I not only a billionaire, it's not, money's not the only thing, I created products that are used by millions of people or hundreds of millions of people and I'm solving big problems for the world. And so the governments have to get off the backs of the entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, I think brains are widely distributed. I think awful lot of brilliant engineers are coming out of IIT. But you know what, there are a lot probably in Central Africa that just are, they're being set on by their governments or in other places of the world. So everywhere, you know, People throw your governments off, rise up, become entrepreneurs. That's a great thing. <laughs> India is along the way of trying to do that. And you're the vanguard. So you're, sorry we're late. Welcome. Hi. You're the entrepreneurial community that can do that. So I saw it in Israel. Because Israel was very socialist. To be an entrepreneur was looked down upon. The best thing to do in the old days was to go into the military, or if you were really smart, be a PhD and go off to university. Uh, or maybe if you're a little bit less smart, be a lawyer, um, something like that. But, but to be a businessman was the, for the retarded children. You know, that was really looked down upon. It's changed all, very much. Now, Israel is entrepreneurial you know, to its core. Now, why has it done so well relative to other big countries like Europe, in Europe and so on? I think it's because they have no market there. And because they have no market there, they didn't get stuck trying to sell local. And they said immediately, you have to go to the world market. Where's the biggest unified, easy, early adopter market to go? And they chose right. They chose the US. Certainly in that era, the 70s, 80s, 90s, when they were really starting to boom, they went to the US market. It was much easier than Europe. It still is much easier than Europe to innovate and adopt here. So that's probably why Israel was successful. Now, Bloomberg Capital, we're an early stage venture fund. We specialize in seed deals. We found that the world of entrepreneurship has changed drastically in the last 10 years. Cost of startup in software has dropped 80% plus, something like that. So the classic venture capital firms, a lot of the large guys, maybe Canaan accepted, are often too big to really deal with the early stage entrepreneurs that want $1 million or so. They're just not really right size anymore. Bloomberg Capital, Dave McClure over here at 500 Startups, there are a number of us that are probably more right sized. Some of those groups are probably also perfectly right sized for in entrepreneurship in India. So we take the view that there's not just innovation in Silicon Valley. It's happening in Israel. It's happening, in, as you said, New York. We have many companies in New York. We have 10 in Berlin. Uh, we have only one so far in India, but we're looking for more. And just in the How hard did that happen? How did the Indian company happen? Yeah. It came out of the 500 startups. We invested with uh, an Indian entrepreneur having to come they brought there. brought the deal to you? Brought the deal to us. Uh, I don't think you brought it to us. We, we found it there. <laughs> but we, we have too many to bring. You've been an LP with my brother. Too. There you go. <laughs> But now we're co-investors, and this company's called MyGola, and it's in Bangalore, but they're moving here. And that's what we're starting to see. And let me just do one more parallelism with Israel. Israel, in the, I would say, 70s, 80s, had a little bit similar phenomenon of the BPO market. They had lower cost engineers. And for a while, Bank of America <coughs> and Fargo would outsource there. But very quickly, as the economists would say, their surplus labor got used up. And so the prices rose. And then these smart 
you know, fidgety Israelis looked at their brothers and sisters at Intel Capital, not Intel Capital, but Intel, Motorola, Cisco, and so on, engineers working here, Israelis working in the R&D centers in Israel, and they said, hey, these guys are leaving Intel and they're starting their own little startup companies, and I'm just as smart or smarter than that guy, I can do it too. And so there was this osmosis effect by having these R&D centers of large multinationals, mainly from the U.S., mainly from Silicon Valley, that the Israelis saw. Now, India's had a lot of that for now. You've seen a lot of that. Most of it's been BPO, less R&D. But I'm ready, I'm waiting, Ankur and I are looking, and we're starting to see a new uptake of deal flow from India, where the market is not necessarily serving the Indian market or serving the BPO of the back office. Um, I don't even want you to be the back office. I, mean, I want you to be front office, OK? <laughs> create IP. Create your own technologies. And the US will be one big market. Now, you are extremely right in saying that the mobile revolution um, changes a lot. And the rising middle class, not only in India, but in China, Africa, Latin America, is phenomenal. So there are whole new businesses that can be created. Naveen mentioned three big areas. We say it more simply. The 19th century was about innovation in transportation, agriculture, and mining, to a huge extent. The 20th century, manufacturing got really fixed. 21st century, service businesses, IP businesses. All the information businesses are ripe for disruption. That's finance, that's education, that's healthcare, that's space travel. All these areas that are service businesses are inefficient. And not only are they inefficient to fix for the first world, but in the third world, billions of people, probably two billion people who were poor 10 years ago, are starting to be middle class in the next 10, 20 years. We can serve them, we can make the world a lot better, and a lot of people can also get very rich. So do a great job and you'll be happy and blessed. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Shantanu is uh, a lawyer. Also, he's uh, the founder of Mumbai Angels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's you know, hundreds of deals, right? At least two. What's changing in India? Um, so, just a two minute background. So, uh, this used to be my stop. One, one, one minute back. Right, one minute. Very close. I used to be uh, around here. I was a uh, corporate lawyer at one of the big law firms down the street. Um, and I left in 2007 to, to be an entrepreneur uh, in the sense of setting up my own firm and kind of creating a, a Silicon Valley style law firm uh, in India. And that was the, the idea. And today we're, uh, we literally started in a garage in Mumbai and today we're 20 lawyers in, in Mumbai and we're going in Bangalore and I, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. as well. Um, so uh, to Rajesh's question uh, regarding what's, what's changed in India, I think uh, the gentleman from Canaan had, had a very good question. Uh, John, yeah. uh, sorry, a very good comment about um, just from what I've seen uh, in the ecosystem, when, when you know we started Mumbai Angels uh, in 2007, uh, I was their, their lawyer who helped set up the structures. Um, and at that time, you know, it was literally set up again. Uh, one of these stories set up around a coffee table. You know, four people discussing uh, how to, to marry you know some capital with with enterprising uh, investors and uh, companies. And when we were filing out the paperwork to, to form this particular type of the Indian equivalent of a nonprofit, we, we filed it with registrar of companies. And we submitted the name as, as Mumbai Angels. And uh, I got a call from the registrar saying, you know, is this a religious organization? <laughs> <laughs> it's me. And I had, you know, I, so I went and I met the officer and I explained to him, you know, angels, this is a very different type of angel. Uh, an angel with money. So it's what you can do. It can also help, help save you. But uh, it's kind of, we actually changed the wording to, to make it a, a mentorship platform. And it's called, the actual legal name is Mumbai Angel Venture Mentors. They, they said, we'll accept it, but just kind of describe it a little bit more so people aren't scared off by what this is. <laughs> so that was the, the early days when we actually had to explain all this. And today, you know, Mumbai Angels is, you know, it's 150 members, and, and they must have done some, I don't know, 100 some deals. And, and that's being emulated across the country. There's Chennai Angels, and I read about Calcutta Angels uh, a few weeks ago. So I think Angel, you know, we don't have to explain it anymore. It's, it's, it's a well understood concept. And the next uh, phase of that is, is, is sort of, uh, accelerators, right? Which is Rajesh and GSF are, are at the forefront of. So I think uh, you know uh, it's a big question. What, what's changed? I think you know this is the natural evolution of, of, of this thing, and, and that gap between the U.S. and India is now. I think that's another you know uh, big thing. It used to be three, three, four years ahead. I think now it's it's almost on par. So, right. so before I open it to the audience, you get the tough one. Steven. Steven uh, has done two things in India. One, he, you built Zynga's business in India, and you also invested in India from your personal capital. So here's the trick question. What are you more cynical about, India or Zynga? <laughs>
<laughs> right, so I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> so thank you. Stephen Laurie and like like Roger said, I've lived in India for the last I lived there two years and one month, I just returned. And I'm bullish about India. I actually was just there last week. Um, go back every quarter. I actually started a networking dinner. So the round zero of, of India actually if you're familiar with that. So networking dinner that we hold every quarter now, but it was every two months, bringing entrepreneurs and investors together for in a format. So anyway, I do that startup connect. And it's grown to be, you know, almost 100 people. Yeah, with, you know, a Sequoia Excel and a tent. So that's been going really well. Anyway, um, I've invested. So I was back there, and I'm bullish. I'm actually looking. I do about seven deals a year, Series A, um, and it's a global bar. So I invest in the U.S. and India. I mean, some deals I've done was Fusion IO, which is the biggest IPO of 2011, Platforo, which is a very promising enterprise company here. Um, so I look at it globally. Like, I will do all the deals in India if I need to, all the deals in the U.S. if I need to. But uh, I got to tell you, there's three there that I saw that I'm going to do. One of them uh, uh, you know, I've been tracking for a while, actually all of them. So, you know, there are real companies there and there's real entrepreneurs. Um, the one part I would disagree with Rajesh is about the innovation. I actually think it's very innovative. In India, because the barriers are extremely high and the headwinds are very hard. So there's operational excellence, innovation that is tremendous. You know, one of the companies invested in is, is building really like a, a brand, you know, e-commerce, you know, brand e-commerce, uh, a product as well, it's just operating in, you know, this is a country where you got to take cash on delivery, you know, with credit cards, and I mean, just getting the product Three around on the road, and, I mean, and this company's going to be, you know, it's going to be huge, and I'm very excited to be part of it, but there's innovation that's at a level that you just don't, don't see here, so I respectfully disagree with my colleague from Delhi on that, in the sense that, uh, there's innovation on every level, even just setting up the company. Um, and by the way, just a plug, and Shantur and I worked together to set up uh, the sort of fun part uh, for Mauritius to invest in that. So he's a great lawyer. If you do any deals in India, you should work with him. I, I do all the deals with, in India with him. Anyway, so I would, I would say that there's incredible innovation we face every day, and um, there's huge opportunities. The biggest question for me, like, for me as a global bar, I do return analysis, and it's, I have sort of criteria to get returns. Um, so I, that's, I, I just look opportunistically. Um, so whether it's India, own, India first or a global play across border is less important to me. I would say that I look at the deals in India and they pretty much are the India, uh, looking at India or the regional market. Um, but it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I just but know you that. You also told me that you build a lot of things and you're now applying yeah. that knowledge to bring yeah. your expertise to the companies you're funding if you yeah. talk about it. Yeah, so so that's just something that's a passion of mine and being a team builder. Although in India, I find that being a U.S. connection is, is a real value there. But anyway, there's a debate in India about is it India first and, you know, or there's going to be this cross-border like in, 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 in Israel. And I don't know. I mean, the Mobi is a great example of the cross-border. But I think there's plenty of opportunities in India. So all three that I'm looking at are actually in India and they're applying. You know, you could say, yeah, they're applying models that have worked in the US, but there's so many, there's such complexity and so many barriers to do that in India that to me that's hugely innovative and are actually barriers to entry. Um, and so I think pretty much all the deals I've done are those kind of uh, deals. So, uh, <coughs> questions, we are running 20 minutes behind. Five questions. First, you identify yourself? Sure. Uh, Eitan, Eitan Ailan. So uh, to share some funny things that came up in the panel. So I was born in the U.S., raised here, serial entrepreneur in high school, in the military in Israel, and the paratroopers, uh, then an equity research analyst covering tech in the valley during the buildup of the bubble, now here as an entrepreneur. So I've made quite a journey. And I would agree with a lot of the panelists' uh, comments that I do think there are going to be many Silicon Valleys, not just one, but they're going to have different characters. My question is, one word that I didn't hear come up today, a uh, very good friend of mine, Navi Raju, wrote a book called Jugad Innovation. And I think that one great advantage of India is, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on it, is that you have to be very clever in India to solve a lot of problems, even basic daily problems. And an example uh, where this has even come back to uh, the West and to very developed, uh, very developed uh, companies, Renault went to India to build a low-cost car for the Indian market. They wound up taking the lessons they learned in India and then applying them back to the European market and doing very well with them. So, can you comment at all on what you've seen in terms of you know, whether or not you think this is a strength or a limitation? 
you know, and kind of, uh, you know, how you see that as an advantage? Who wants to take it? I can start, and I'm, I'm sure you know. Maybe Stephen wants to add or something. We can uh, pitch in. Uh, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, so it, it's something that that Stephen actually brought up in terms of, uh, and I alluded to. But is it is it actually more competitive? The, the nuts and bolts stuff is that much harder to do, and so people are just uh, fine tuned to actually find their navigate their way around daily hurdles. When I put on an investor hat, and if I were to look at it from here, at the end of the day, what you're delivering. Uh, you spend, uh, let's say you've got you know 100 points of energy, you spend 60 points of energy navigating that and 40 on product and stuff like that. And when you always look at products as one example coming out from India, you know, we always have felt a little bit short change on what we've delivered from a product and a design perspective. And some of that if you look through, uh, you know, if you dig deep is because 60% of the energy is doing the mundane stuff. You flip that around here, you know, 80, 90 percent of your energy is going into into defining that. So, where does a jugar work? And jugar is just smart innovation. You know, is is not really uh, breaking the rule, but finding ways around it. And, we, and I guess people do it in their in their tax filings. People do it, in, you know, corporates do it. Everybody does it, and we have a name for it. It's jugar, and it's acceptable working your way around the system. So, sure that that is. A, I just think it's a disproportionate amount of jugar that we are forced to execute. And then when you're looking. At, you know, Stephen is saying that I'm looking at, uh, I can invest in a US company or an Indian company. He's got to see, you know, where the returns are coming out of and, and the chances are that uh, when you're spending 90% of your time on, on the business as such and solving the problem and not getting around, you know, incorporating or, or, or doing a deal just for payments. I mean, payments is such a massive problem. There are probably 40 companies trying to solve that. Now, imagine that, if that payments were to be a fundamental issue to deal with. In, 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 in the valley, just to get paid for what you're putting out there, it just kills the entire proposition, right? So, uh, he also has a view. Sure. Oh, sure. Just um, related nearby, not quite India, but Bangladesh, right nearby. I once had a visitor 20 years ago, 30 years ago in my house, unknown man then, he's now extremely famous, uh, by the name of uh, Muhammad Yunus. And um, I had him to my house because I had a vegetarian house and it was the only place he could eat from the State Department <laughs> visit. Anyway, he told me this, he told me this amazing uh, story that for Jugar, okay, he wanted to help women, poor women in the villages. And he wanted to get them out to work. And, you know, they would spend the money more responsibly than the men, which we all know is true. And so the, the village elders, the Muslim elders were saying to him, no, 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 we can't have the women out because they need to stay home. And then he said, ah, but is it not true that the Prophet Muhammad, he blessed, da, 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 um, gave us the veil so women could go outside. They do not need to have a veil inside the house. And so by using this, you know, getting around the system, he used the system to get it. Now, he did microfinance. Now, as I'm saying, it's an example of something that revolutionized the world with microfinance. Now, with the world coming up uh, from poverty to middle class, people need credit. Middle class people need credit. And most countries around do not have real good credit for most middle class people. So we're taking his idea, uh, Mami Nir's idea, and putting it on the web, essentially, through a company called Lendo. And they use Facebook data to figure out if you're a good credit risk when there are countries with no credit bureaus whatsoever. So it's an example that came out of, in this case, Bangladesh, but similar. And so there is a lot of these kinds of good ideas. Go around the system, break the thing, fix it, and the rest of us can then benefit as well. Yeah, just, just one point, Rajesh, on that. I'm not sure I agree that there's different Silicon Valleys. I really, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs there are, are, a lot of them have spent time in the U.S. They're solving, you know, in probably the same way, same mindset. So I, I, I disagree. I, I don't see that. I mean, there's one thing is that you get the coaching here, like the quality of the presentations. You know, you go to these demo days and things come out of it. They get three months. And so there you may not, but, but, the, but the entrepreneurs have the same mindset. So I, I really don't see it. It's yeah, so, so, so separate Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think that... The yeah, there's, a, there's, questions. <laughs> there's a little bit of phenomenon going here right here in the U.S., and it's Boston. The Boston market was initially a great IT place, and uh, I worked at DEC a long time ago, so I know. And it is not the same place it was back then in the 80s, and, and they're suffering kind of a, a, a drag on entrepreneurship. When the biggest, name the big internet company in Boston. There is one. Facebook. Yeah, which is here. Right? Exactly. That's my question, right? Too. All these companies moved out of there, and yet within our own country, in an area that was very entrepreneurial, even there we see a difference between here. And the one common thing, because we invest across the U.S., India, and Israel, same kind of thing like you, you know, we're going to find the best deals wherever they come from, is our thesis. Um, the one thing I find about is India versus Israel, Israel has learned as a, as a group 
how to make an enterprise. It's one thing to have a good idea. There's a lot of good small businesses, and they'll do very fine. But if you want to create a large enterprise and retain talent, as you were, we were talking about earlier, retention of talent is critical. And having people who know how to lead large groups of people to move toward the same drummer, to be organized, to solve problems. That's the real change. That's the difference between a little company and something like Google or Facebook or Apple. And if you can re-energize yourself or not, you feel like Microsoft's dying right now because they can't figure this out. We were talking over, walking over, you are talking about that. Apple figured out how to do it. But India has a number of large BPO companies that way. They have a large, large, you know, reliance, right? Big company, done a lot of stuff. We need a way for Indian entrepreneurs, I think, to figure out how do you build a large enterprise effectively. And what we found is that we need to import some management talent there. Because the people who worked in the big old corporations, it's like, I don't want a person out of IBM or GE. They don't get entrepreneurship. And some of my colleagues came out of GE. You know, it's just a different mindset. And we need that. There's a gap right now. And so usually that gap comes from the people at Facebook or Google or Apple who've come out and they spin out and do it again and show everyone else how to do it. We have a little bit of a gap there. And I think if we're going to get India to rise, and Israel picked up some of this, we have got to teach not just how to be an engineer, there's great minds. We've got to get the, the middle managers, the people who can grab the larger workforces and get them to move. I mean, that's going to change things so that you're effective on a much larger scale. Great point. So you have a question. Yeah, so uh, my name's Nima. I travel throughout the Middle East. I haven't been to India, but I hear the same themes, you know, the problems with the infrastructure as far as payments, cash on delivery, e-commerce. Is it possible to build billion dollar businesses uh, in these big markets when the infrastructure for payments and security and cash and delivery isn't solved? Or, or is it going to be you know, smaller chunk divided into smaller chunks? Because I hear the same uh, story in, in the Middle East, 400 million users, um, self penetration is going through the roof, uh, social is going through the roof. I heard a stat saying that e-commerce in the Middle East is around 9 billion, and it, sh it should be 400 times higher. But as long as these fundamental problems aren't solved, that infrastructure isn't there. Is it similar? Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, that? That's certainly a challenge. Of, uh, you know, I alluded to that saying that the, the, the revenue scale is the issue because of these issues. Uh, but, uh, but we have created companies that are now pushing that. Uh, they, they've now crossed the billion dollar valuation mark, and that's a start. And uh, I think uh, it's going to be, it'll take a while to get a billion dollar revenue company just focused on the Indian market. I think that the goal right now is to create those large companies that are focusing on global problems, but coming out of India. And that's the first step to it. And you know, stuff like, uh, and having more accelerators and mentors, I think to, 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 your, uh, to your point about, we need more, the ID services business took off, the VPO services business took off because there were four or five people who, who went out there, did that, and proved that they could create a billion dollar corporation. That hasn't happened necessarily in consumer internet and tech yet. And so uh, as that scales, and Inmobi is a good example, and you know, Redbus is a good example in India, uh, and when those happen, it's, it's bound to happen, and we need to inject a lot more mentorship into the community, and that I think will, uh, you know, one, one cool idea that's coming out is if we can create a co-founder, uh, a company that finds co-founders matching talent here with, with folks over there and actually does that, it's actually just bridging the gap of this mentorship piece. But that would be that would be cool. Yeah, I'll tell you, what, our company, United Lex, um, which is the legal outsourcing company, but. They have a U.S. and a India presence it, simultaneously when they started the company. In fact, the CEO is American, and they figured out that they were better balancing the re result and getting it as a sharing of information. The company is very robust, well, well managed, um, and it, I just look at that versus some of the companies that we see are just doing everything purely in India without that tutelage, either from the yeah. founders and the companies that we see really accelerating there have had a taste of how do I build something bigger. Some of the companies that we have that are growing, they've seen that vision somewhere else. They had that experience and brought it back, and they've then hired the right people to help accelerate the use you know, I, I think and, that the thought around Pogmatics, Comely is another example of yeah. a similar mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. I wonder how scalable it is. Just to conclude your thought before we take next question, uh, clearly lack of infrastructure is stopping that realization of multi-billion markets that can be unleashed. Especially on payment, we have this Aadhaar system that is being put up. Many of you may be familiar, 250 million people have already been written as scanned. And uh, just has to open it for payment APIs. And we will leapfrog even America. So uh, the question is, if you are a business, should you wait for that moment to happen, or should you start building business now? 
and then you do that transformation. Right? Does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah, I think David was saying service business. I mean, <coughs> literally, it's an open market. Everything could be built, and uh, the problem is, do you build ahead and then wait for some solution, or do you? Market timing issue. Yeah. So we can but take one or two more questions. So you, please one go more. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Hakeem. Uh, I'm originally from India. Been here for a few years. Stanford graduate, working at a gaming startup in uh, San Francisco. Um, so, like one thing that I see over here that excites young entrepreneurs to come up with new ventures and stuff like that is quick rewards. And contrast, when you see like most of the success stories that you hear from India and other emerging markets are basically businesses that kind of grow over a long period and then grow into big profitable companies and stuff. So how much do you think that factor plays into account in terms of you know motivating entrepreneurs to come out and as you know as investors going into emerging markets like that, how how, how do you see you kind of facilitate to Great question. make Great question. Quick money wants to take. David, do you want to take Well yeah, yeah I think you are all living in an amazingly lucky time because even just 10 years ago, most of us in venture capital were investing in the enter classic enterprise model, which took 20 or 30 million dollars, and it took seven or 10 years, and there was always a business cycle that got in the way, and so the early investors like us got creamed, and the late stage guys would make some money, but you know, it was a really rough world. Today, you start to scale on a small amount of money, a million or two, and you can start to see whether the companies are gonna really take off. And sometimes they fail, and then you have the aqua hires, which help you get some return you didn't get before which is a sale of the people, of the team. But in the, the, when they start to go up, the valuations go up so fast that the early stage investors are not getting so diluted. It's, it's amazing dominant. And early stage investors are very parallel to you as an entrepreneur. We're right at the same uh, world. So you're getting less uh, diluted as well. So I think the time is now for these things. And again, the, so, the, the power of social media and um, mobile phones is remarkable in terms of opening markets for hundreds of millions of new people that could never be your customers before. Remember, Renren, who said it was Renren? You did. I always like to say about Renren, it's worth, what, $60 billion today? And you know what they sell? They sell nothing to poor people. <laughs> Think about it. They sell electrons to the lower classes in China. It's amazing what you can do. Yeah, so I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't see any, I, I just a vibrancy in India. I mean, there's entrepreneurs. Because I manage these people, they've gone and uh, started companies, and people, <coughs> people want to go and start it. It's a dream. So whether they can be aqua hired or not, like here, you kind of have the downside probably covered a little bit more. But I don't see that affecting the behavior of the entrepreneurs or whether to start. I don't think that's determinant of it. I've seen no evidence of that. And also for an investor, that's not why we invest. You know, we're investing for. I mean, I got to get five x at least. I mean, I'm, I'm, some of them I've done many more than ten or twenty x. You know, we're not investing for the aqua hire. So those things are nice if it's better than <coughs> going out of business, but I don't see a change in behavior from the investor or the entrepreneur. There's more structural uh, issues me, yeah. at play that have big impact, <coughs> it's not that. Let, let me add two points. If you look at Make My Trip or Knockery or earlier companies that started early 2000, late 90s, they've taken 10 to 12 years to give exits or go to scale where the founders were perceived as iconic founders therefore became role models for others. If you look at companies like Flipkart, Snapdeal, Inmobi, they've taken about four or five, six years to go to scale. Uh, yet not there for IPO, maybe another year or so, because, but they've gone to scale, right? So the timing issue is getting sorted out. It's not gonna happen in one or two years. It'll still take eight years to build scale company. Right? Does that answer you a little bit? Yeah. The second is the whole, I, I would wish, for my accelerator or for anyone else, the more role models you create, the more people who create wealth, and more distributed it gets, and more wealthy the, the wealth gets spread as an exit happens, it just unleashes the ecosystem. We just need to get two or three such things going, and I think India will be overflowing with ambitious people. Uh, one last question and we're done. I'll tell you about what you should be um, Okay, granted, maybe the runway is the same, But what makes, I think, Silicon Valley unique is that most people are chasing the exit. A lot of these IPO, you know, a lot of the startups are like, we can't wait for Google to snatch us up. But that's the goal. Um, 
In India, I don't see that happening as much. You don't have these large acquiring companies nearby who are just going to, you know, give you that that exit quicker. Um, and also, you're operating, and I think, in more of a volatile environment externally, given government policies, entrepreneurial friendly laws. So, how do you then? You don't have the stable economy of these. Even governments change so quickly. You know the. Governments have not so changed that quickly. The same government is ruling for 10 years. I wish but it would change. <laughs> 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 but the government policies, the <laughs> government <laughs> policies are not as... No, no, the problem is opposite. The problem is not that the government policies are not changing. They're not changing fast enough. So we need more, far more reforms to happen faster, quicker, to create new creativity and new blood and energy into the system. So Just to correct you. Right? So it's not volatile. It's not volatile. It's, not volatile. it's, not it's stable. Sort of it should not be stable. It should be far stable. more volatile. Volatility is what entrepreneurs love. They thrive on volatility. Uh, and this is what happened in Russia, where so much wealth got created out of wrong sort of volatility. We need to have forward momentum. So that, I think that's on the policy side. I just wanted to correct your perception. On exit side, probably you can. Uh, yeah, I, it, there's two questions along this line. I think there's a little misnomer going on. And I think the press is not helping us. The facts are that most startups take a long time. Okay, we've been doing this 25 years in our firm. And yeah, it's great. I mean, we've had companies, you know, very few companies hit their business plan. Very few. I mean, less than 1 2%. It would be out of the first thing we do. It takes time to iterate a company. And you know, I'd love to be on Instagram if somebody was good luck. That's great. YouTube, that happens. Those are Roman candles in an environment where most things don't operate. That so they get a lot of press, but that's not really what goes on. And um, one of our companies is Kabam. Again, I don't know if that's a company to work for. But that company went through two pivots until they finally found marketing, you know, gaming. And now they're one of the big gaming companies. Uh, next year. Um, but that took time. And the thing is that press, and I saw this in 2000, You'd have, you know, we started a company, it's been really tough, raised some money, next thing you know, we're high-fiving each other in the back of the limo because we just went public. Yet the company wasn't much of a company, but, you know, at that time, the IPOs were everything. And then, even if you knew the stories, the story was written about the company, it's not the story that really happened. And I think, you know, you need a little of that glow of, you know, these are how entrepreneurship, we need those role models of Mark Zuckerberg or something. But if you're gonna get an entrepreneurship, you're gonna be down a long and lonely road, it's gonna be tough. It, the adversity is unbelievable. It's the funnest thing you could ever do, but it takes work, and there is no one you know quick trick. Otherwise, we'd be raising funds every year and just churning out billions of dollars. And I got to tell you, it's pretty hard. So we have to get real. There's a balance between the fantasy of the entrepreneurship and the reality of it. And I think you need a little bit of both to get people into the water. And if they like it, realize, hey, I can do this. I think the biggest thing is people can do it. And it's not being afraid to take the first step. I think step. a great point to end on, fantasy and reality, <laughs> and a little bit of both. <laughs> Fantastic panel. I learned so much. Give them a big hand. You're running. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Sandy Miller of Singularity University. And also let you know, anyone who's already on their devices or has one in your pocket, please go to our Facebook page at GSF Accelerator and engage with us there. We'd love all of you to be frequent commentators. And um, and I've also posted a question for our GSF 13 applicants. Um, any questions they have for this group in the room, so they've posted a few questions for you. Please engage with them on our Facebook page. Um, and Sandy is... Um, Without with slides, so whenever you want to begin. Uh, so I am with uh, another institution that also happens to go by the initials of SU. But one of the things we're going to talk about is maybe it's it's sort of um, instead of Stanford University, it's maybe an alternative or another model uh, for um, you know an institution like uh, Stanford University. And that Singularity University, which is um, about 15 minutes down the road um, in Mountain View, uh, we're located right near uh, Google on uh, NASA Research Park uh, in Mountain View. So we literally can throw a rock and hit, you know, a building at Google if we want to. We don't want to do that. We like Google. Um, but just a, a quick background about me is 
I was, uh, I worked at Stanford for 13 years, from 1995 to 2008, and um, ran uh, basically the medical device center here at Stanford um, called Biodesign. Uh, there's actually a Stanford India Biodesign, and um, which was really exciting. And that program, it's medical device innovation and entrepreneurship, and it's been replicated all around the world. There are now 25 biodesign-like programs around the world. But um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is sort of from a in the trenches view of some of the activities of um, entrepreneurship and innovation um, and what it's what it's uh, like inside a university like a Stanford. And then sort of talking about the overall objective from an impact standpoint and what we're doing at Singularity University. Um, in between Stanford and Singularity University, I was at the Kauffman Foundation where I ran its accelerator, which was Kauffman Labs for Enterprise Creation. So I got to th see things at a, a pretty broad perspective and ran a couple of their entrepreneurship uh, education programs um, and was involved with uh, some really fun studies. I was there when they funded Eric Ries's Lean Startup book. They also seeded things like AngelList and Startup Weekend and some other really cool things that are uh, having a very cool impact. Um, I'm sure several of you have heard about uh, or will hear about it. Uh, you can use those resources um, as entrepreneurs. Thanks. So uh, Singularity was founded by two innovators and entrepreneurs, Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. Ray is a futurist technologist innovator and Peter Diamandis is a founder of the XPRIZE Challenge. And Singularity's mission is to um, really educate and inspire people to um, develop what we call exponentially advancing technologies to address humanity's grand challenges. So this is going to be central to some of the messages I'm going to be talking about. When I talk about grand challenges, um, it's, it's, tech, uh, it's uh, areas such as education, energy, environment, food, water security, poverty, global health. Um, so, by the way, those do correspond to very large markets. Um, but these are really some of the world's biggest problems. And then, and then what we, we also look at is sort of the, the application of what we call exponential technologies um, uh, to solve, to address some of these big problems. And so, examples of exponential technologies at the moment are things ranging from 3D printing, um, synthetic biology, uh, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, and, and many others. And, and as time changes and new technologies come to the fore, um, you know, those exponential technologies will, as the name implies, will, will, will certainly change. But the point is really, you know, in, in one sense we talk about just sort of the um, what, what exponential technologies are is really the, the natural sort of extension and application and when, as Moore's Law, the consequence of Moore's Law really sort of running smack into, you know, in demand. And uh, Ray Kurzweil sort of uh, theorized that, you know, that, that man, you know, uh, interface with these technologies is really going to hit, you know, around 2045 just to sort of put something out there and be controversial. So we'll see um, if that's the date. You know, we'll probably all be standing by the calendar watching that. Um, but as we're sitting here in this institution, uh, Stanford University, and, and going back to Naveen's comments about education, um, I wanted to address the things that are really hot in, around universities uh, in, in the major media right now. And that is, you know, St President, Stanford's president, John Hennessy, is an entrepreneur. And one of the things we know, right, there's so many stories about entrepreneurs and, and um, they do these crazy things and everybody tells them, no, it's not going to work. Um, so one of the things that's interesting, and, and John Hennessy has a history from when he was uh, chair of Stanford's, uh, computer, uh, Stanford's engineering school, um, of sort of helping students who were involved in things like Google and Yahoo, to sort of here, go, get out, you know, start the company, and um, move. And so fast forward to now, and you sort of see, you know, this, uh, this article, and 
And, and guess what? In the uh, era of the print media really looking to make a lot of sales, they put these very um, controversial headlines out. Um, and there are certainly a lot of details in this. Um, this is just more about the level of controversy and just sort of the tension between the, the traditional, you know, top tier basic research institution and as it's trying to be innovative and entrepreneurial. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the Stanford president just get slammed for it. Um, just slammed. And and because I, I can tell you, he didn't do this for the money. You know, he's, he's, he's fine. He's really fine, trust me. Um, and then, you know, you see the follow on, you know, Wall Street and then and then this guy, he's like, well, gee, I can, I, we can get to generate some, some nice revenue for us, some good, good traffic, good ad sales. Oh, maybe this is the end of uh, Stanford. And that's a, that's a great catchy title. So the only reason I bring this up is, and again, there are some, you know, there's, there's, uh, there are details, there's a lot of complexity in this issue. Uh, not only in the specific case, but just in all the things that come to bear when you're doing this activity in the university context. And I'm not, um, minimizing the complexity of that issue. I'm just sort of giving an example of, man, to do this in the university setting, it can be pretty challenging. But going back, you know, I showed you Singularity's mission, right, for impact, right? Um, but also, I mean, Stanford's mission was established in 1885, and frankly, there's, there's some commonality here. Um, you know, we're all, we're all sort of on the same page in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, you know, on behalf of humanity and civilization, it sounds like we're still trying to benefit society and have that impact. Um, so that's pretty interesting in, in, in seeing the tensions and seeing how things are changing over time. Again, just a very high level, um, you know, and following on uh, you know, Bean's comments about education and, and what's going on, you know, some of the things that are working at Stanford pretty uniquely, and Stanford's, uh, frankly, a model for this, is, again, um, you know, Stanford actually does a pretty good job, appropriate, you know, university industry relationships. You know, I can tell you in dealing with industry when I was here, you know, uh, sponsored research uh, issues, and I mean, they really, there's, a, there's quite a priority on uh, aspects like freedom to publish, you know, students, uh, the priority for students and their educational experience. Um, Stanford has, you know, incredible, it's really the, one of the best um, licensing offices in the world. Same thing with their conflict of interest process. They're, they're really looked to as a model. Um, and obviously they're in Silicon Valley and all of that comes with it. Um, but, you know, again, from this perspective of, of doing this uh, from the trenches, even at a place like Stanford with all these with all of these things that you, you, know, you think of as advantages, I can tell you is that this activity is still pretty hard, even at a place like Stanford. It's really hard. Um, and, and so some of those things are, man, the, the costs, you know, the tax to do research, uh, you know, from a company standpoint, um, pretty, pretty tough, particularly in this market. Culture. Um, you know, there's no, frankly, there's, for the faculty, there's not a lot of incentive alignment in terms of their promotion um, to do, uh, to invent. It's, you know, it's generate papers, 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 papers to promotion, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to sort of give you a framing here. Next. And then, you know, what's, what's happening right now in education is, as uh, Naveen teed up so nicely for me, as if we had planned it, which we didn't, uh, Naveen, by the way, is a trustee of Singularity University. I should mention that. Um, education is this trillion-dollar global market that is being massively disrupted, massively disrupted uh, by a whole range of things. And you know, I just put a few examples um, up, and and you have you know both the just-in-time learning, uh, free, you know, Khan Academy. You have this educational model of the Teal Fellowship where. You know, Peter Thiel is, you know, attracting the, the best and brightest, and this is sort of an incentive, and, and basically saying, listen, there's the, you know, the value of your time, you know, for a certain type of person, you know, relative to what you'd be doing in, uh, in you know, in undergraduate school, maybe the value of your time to, like, actually do it is worth more than, you know, than your undergrad. 
Because you can do the undergrad later if that's what you want to do. And, and he's just sort of posing the question, and it's absolutely an experiment. Um, absolutely. But there are, uh, they actually are just picking their third class. I'm, I am a mentor for that program. Uh, you have, you know, the online on-demand courses and platforms, some of which is fr have frankly spun out of Stanford, of Coursera and Udacity that people are experimenting with. So just tons of things happening in education. So back to singularity, what, I wanted to tee that up just to give you a sense of um, this, this initiative. And we are, we are five years old, so we're very young. And we have some really new, unique elements that um, particularly with, that I think are quite complementary to those of you uh, in this program. And you're going all around the world because you know, entrepreneurship business is global. So, so um, Rajesh, you know, I mean, that's sort of the founding principle. So you're getting this exposure out of the gates because that's the way it is. Um, and uh, next. And so just, just uh, you know, our name is a bit of a misnomer. It's, we are called Singularity University, but we're actually not an accredited university. We, we don't grant any degrees. Um, frankly, it's, it's a very high level uh, executive education with um, highly applied uh, faculty and speakers that we bring in. Uh, real world expertise is, is critical. Um, our curriculum, our, the content, the way we teach, the methodologies, the, the workshops, it, we constantly refresh that. Um, and we certainly don't have, you know, charge 60, 70 percent for, you know, to engage with industry. We um, have, we actually have more of a, a customer, you know, relationship uh, to, to do that. So that means our sense of urgency and, and responsiveness for industry um, is, you know, they're, we're, they're our uh, customers, so we need to treat them well. And guess what? Uh, for public companies, companies that need to be responsive to quarterly markets, that's really important to them. IP ownership, and I'm going to tell you in a little bit about our programs, but um, you know we do quote take ownership initially to um, things that come out of our, our summer program, but frankly we do it just because we have students operating in a team, and it's just to sort of for a moment in time say okay who's going to do this, who's going to do that, and then you know once we sort of settle that, um, we literally are granting back royalty free licenses, you know to who's going forward with it. Um, and we have uh, a network now of, of alumni in just five years that's grown. Um, so we have a network of over 1,200 people that have gone through our programs, both our graduate studies program, our 10-week summer program that I'm going to show you, as well as our executive programs. And that is an incredibly robust, active network. Please. So just to give you a sense of our summer program, we select students that are tops in their field. Um, this just gives you a sense of our applicants for each summer over the past few years. Um, they really have to demonstrate um, uh, 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 behaviors of leadership and entrepreneurship and um, you know, experience in the field and in these grand challenge areas. Then we have this 10, uh, 10 week program um, Typical, uh, we have 80 students in every, in every program, 35 uh, the students represent usually somewhere between 35 or so countries. And the average age might be 30, 32, but the spectrum is, you know, we had, uh, last year we had a student who was, you know, an 18 year old PhD student, and then we had somebody who was in their early 50s. So it's, it's quite the first. Next. And this just gives you a high level view of the 10-week um, program, the summer program, where as they come in, they're really exposed to um, those grand challenge areas, the uh, core curriculum, um, under getting up to speed on these exponential technologies. Um, they go to site visits to companies throughout Silicon Valley. They have uh, workshops where they're applying what they're learning. Importantly, they're also developing skills around team. Uh, dynamics, team formation, innovation, etc. And then they shift in the latter part of the program to, uh, to teams that they, they stay with for the rest of the uh, program where they're actually working on a grand challenge problem. And the, the hope is that some of those team projects will go forward beyond the program 
um, and become uh, efforts that are ultimately going to benefit and impact society. Next. So I just want to give you one example. What, is, what does a project look like? So a couple of years ago, uh, the challenge was the observation that there are um, you know, 1.4 billion people in extreme poverty. They have no access to uh, all season roads. And that with, um, with a, uh, a matter net, they called it, uh, with um, UAVs that um, they could address um, this, this, this issue um, in a low cost way. And so this, these are very early uh, uh, prototypes of a company that was formed in 2011, and I just uh, am showing quotes from a couple of publications. Matternet um, uh, recently um, got some funding from Andreessen Horowitz, um, which is pretty exciting, and their uh, drones are they are um, inc uh, incredibly advanced in the, in the design from here. This is very early uh, work, um, but just to give you a sense. And this is basically GPS um, controlled uh, uh, drones that go and deliver these drugs. <laughs> just real quick, you know, lots of uh, opportunities with the, um, the human gene, uh, genome sequencing and uh, the, the fact that the cost uh, is going down so quickly. Again, Moore's Law, next. Next. So one of our faculty, Andrew Hessel, uh, making the point, and this is just talking about the fact that, you know, as, as these new technologies and capabilities come to bear, you know, that it really calls, goes back to this education and the traditional model uh, question because if the technologies are moving so fast and your ability to now treat things uh, like DNA as code, to what extent does a traditional, you know, uh, bi biological sort of education map onto that? How do you, how do you keep up? You know, because, and so that's the issue, is, is the traditional university education uh, going to be able to be as responsive to all of these changes that are happening so fast in these fields? Because this, what's happening in, uh, you know, as with DNA as code and what people are doing with it, it just blows your mind. And it's just moving so fast. Which we want it to happen, right? It's going to help us all be healthy and so forth. And this is just sort of a quick overview of, of the Functional Genome Project, uh, J. Craig Venter's um, Institute. Thanks. And we, in our um, accelerator portfolio, which I'm going to tell you a little bit, we have a few companies sort of working in this space. We have a software front as a tool for companies, hardware, DNA printing, modern meadow, DNA um, uh, tissue, 3D tissue printing. Next. So I'm quickly going to talk about our portfolio for our accelerator, Singularity Labs. Next. Uh, we have three sort of initiatives under the labs umbrella. Um, I'm going to focus on the accelerator next. This is our portfolio. Um, this is sort of uh, very fluid. We have another several companies to add to this that we're reaching the point where it uh, is going beyond the slide. And um, just to give a couple other, uh, call out a couple other companies, Get Around is peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing. This also came out of one of our um, uh, graduate studies programs. So the observation that, um, you know, we actually use our cars uh, only about 7% of the time, so you know, our cars are very lonely. <laughs> they could be used, uh, utilized a lot more. So Get Around is competing head-to-head uh, -head with companies like Zipcar and others. Uh, San Francisco happens to be one of the, the hot markets for this. Uh, uh, made in space, 3D printing in space, uh, et cetera. Next. And one of the things I wanted to point out also is just our portfolio is, is unique in several aspects. So the majority of our companies have come from either projects uh, from our summer program or from our alumni. Um, so we have companies that are a few months old or a few years old. We have companies, because of our focus on the uh, global grand challenges, we have companies uh, across many different sectors. 
Um, so it's not just web, social media, it's not just health, you know, healthcare IT, it's a very broad, very diverse um, sector. And then we have companies that are globally distributed because our community, uh, our network is, is globally distributed. So when we are running um, our entrepreneurship, you know, education programming for our, our companies, we are um, having calls where we're, you know, we're in our conference room or, or event room, but we also have folks calling in from all over the world because it is global. It's like you guys are running all, all over the world, meeting investors all over the world, forming relationships. It is global. Next. I uh, just wanted to, you know, show that they're getting press uh, all over the place. Next. And more press. And these are just uh, examples of some of the investors who um, have invested in some of our companies. Next. And just an example of some of the services. This is not going to be that surprising. Um, you know, facilitating in, uh, introductions to investors, advisors, so forth. Um, but a lot of the things that um, accelerators and incubators do. Next. We have a vendor partners program. Uh, discounts for our companies. Next, um, just sort of a representative sample, a representative sample of some of the things we do in any given week. Next, we have space. Um, you don't have to have space. You don't have to be co-located. Uh, again, but we do have space. Um, you can have a desk. You can do a, an office. Next, and I wanted to just. Uh, quickly uh, let you know that we have, we will have three uh, companies that um, uh, Rajesh and Marguerite were kind enough to uh, include in the pitches this afternoon. And you know, with the global, global theme, um, they're in, in the back of the room. So what, we have Nikon with Pull Approach, who's gonna talk about social enterprise. And um, Nikon also, uh, all three of these um, entrepreneurs, uh, spend their time going around the world running their businesses. Andre Begner from uh, Authentize is here, Andre. And uh, Francisco Palau with Lean Monitor uh, is here also. So this is me, if you want to contact me. This is our uh, Twitter, and um, thank you. It's been a uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks, Sandy. Next, we have a really exciting portion of our program. We have seven of the 15 startups from our class 2012 here traveling with us on the World Expedition. And to begin, so we have seven of them presenting to you. To begin, we have Avantika from Square Key. <coughs> I'm going to start talking while we're just pulling up the slides because we're running behind schedule. Good afternoon. How many of you here have heard of uh, brands like Louis Vuitton, Gucci, um, or and or um, Prada? <laughs> these, just like heard of. Um, these are luxury brands that are available in India today. Now, how many of you here have heard of BCBG, Tory Burch, Ben Sherman, or Nicole Miller? These are mid-segment premium brands that are not available in India today. Why is that important? Over the last five, a few years, what we've seen in India is a huge consumer change. We've also seen a huge social change with the development of the middle class, the upper middle class, the lower upper class, and of course the existing sliver of the upper class segment. Collectively, now what India has is an urban consumer, the creation of an urban consumer. These urban consumers now make up over 300 million consumers transacting online, giving us a market opportunity of a online market opportunity of two and, a, two and a half billion in a couple of years. So that's where we come in. Oh, really? <laughs> Isn't that there? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Mind you, we're a global business, but our first market is 
India because we feel it's a low-hanging fruit uh, for us. So we want to eat that apple before we move on to Southeast Asia and then eventually Europe. Um, so we're an editorially driven lifestyle e-retailer with access to current season Western premium brands at parity price. A couple of key words here, content, current season, premium brands, and parity price. I'll get to these in a bit. Just let me quickly talk about the team. We're a team uh, based both out of New York and Mumbai um, of in industry insiders with over 160 plus years of experience. Um, I myself have over 18 years of experience in brand management, marketing, and product development across corporate as well as startups. I've had my fair share of failures in startups, but also successes, the most being uh, an IPO on NASDAQ within three short years post-product launch. Next. So what problem are we solving? You heard Naveen say you've got to solve a problem. Of course you've got to solve a problem, otherwise you've got no value proposition. So we're solving a problem both on the market side as well as the consumer side. On the market side, when you look at brands, Brands are extremely frustrated about entering the Indian market. They want to. They have to. There is no growth here stateside. There's no growth in Europe. The growths are in markets such as India, Brazil, and China. But it's really frustrating for them because there are many barriers for them to enter the Indian market, regulatory, legal, compliance, and financial. So what do we do? We create that platform for them that brands describe as a riskless platform, which is compliant on all fronts, regulatory, legal, um, uh, on a compliance level, as well as allows them to enter a new market without having to put up that deep investment from a financial perspective. On the consumer side, what problem are we solving there? If you're an Indian consumer like me having grown up, you don't have access to brands, you don't have access to current merchandise, and most of all, you don't want to pay that extra customs duty on your product uh, or, or purchase because really your, the product's being priced out of the market. And then the consumer says, well, I'll wait till year end, till my Europe trip or my state, state trip to do my shopping. So there we solve for a huge unmet consumer need in terms of product availability, but also not treating that consumer as a second class citizen and giving them currencies and product at parity price. So in other words, you know, that Nicole Miller sweater, I'm just picking on you, if it's $150 here, it'll be the equivalent of $150 in India with no surcharges. So there's a great value proposition to the consumer that we provide. I spoke about content. Why is that so important? It's not just important in the Indian market because in India being one of the largest content consumers, but it's also important from us meeting a, a very large unmet consumer need, which is education on lifestyle. Now, these urban consumers in India, they exist. They want to live a Western lifestyle, but how to, they, they're not sure. So there's a huge educational need for them to understand, learn about brands, learn about general lifestyle. They want to live an aspirational Western lifestyle. They want a sliver of life from here delivered to their doorsteps in India. So sitting on a content platform allows us to do that. We launched in August last year in, in a soft launch format with no marketing spend, no social media spend. We were very conscious about our UX. We wanted to make it clean, single-minded, and sophisticated. Um, a lot of you here would say, what's the big deal? Well, log on to an Indian e-commerce site and see what the big deal is. There's what I call Diwali happening when you log on to an e-commerce site. What I mean by that is there's too much bling, too much buzz, too much flash. You've lost the bloody consumer before you've given them an opportunity to make a decision on what you want them to make a decision on. So we, we've been very conscious on our development of the UX. Not only has it differentiated us, but it's allowed us to capture a pretty successful market. To share with you some numbers, over the last six months, um, what well, seven months now that I have six months numbers here, again, uh, prefacing it with no marketing spend, no social media spend, we've seen over a 30% month on month growth. We've seen gross margins of over 50%, but most importantly, we've addressed a very critical question, which a lot of the Indian investors asked me for a few years before we put Squarky together, which is, is the Indian consumer ready to spend premium pricing online? 
our average price per unit right now is 8,400 rupees per product. That's not even basket size. A basket size is one and a half times that. Thank you. Uh, and mind you, this is completely organic. So there's no superficiality here because we haven't spent in the market as yet. Uh, let's go ahead. Yeah. So with that, I think I'll stop here. That was a bit of a speedy pitch uh, to take any questions um, anyone has here. Mind you, before I take the question, I just wanted to address what you raised earlier in terms of your question about barriers uh, in the infrastructure in terms of payment. I call them problems of yesterday. We have new problems to solve today. So our prede predecessors like Flipkart, Jabong, Mintra, Yebi, you know, the top five Amazons of India have already solved for those problems. So COD, big deal in COD, you know, that's part of the infrastructure, it's part of the payment system. So there are new problems to be solved today. We don't see that being a big barrier or hurdle for us. So why did you choose? Uh, sorry, sorry, we can't take questions now. Actually, we're really tight and behind schedule. So afterwards, yeah. maybe Vandy can be here right now. Cool. Hi everyone. I'm Sachin Gupta. I'm a co-founder of a company called Hacker Earth. So I'll just start without these slides. Uh, Hacker Earth is solving the talent problem for tech companies around the globe. I'll give you a perspective. Each year, there are more than thousands of tech companies that are cropping up. And there are hundreds and thousands of graduates being churned out annually. In India itself, there are 100,000 IT graduates that come out each year. Now that's a massive number. In the last two, three hours, we have been talking about how education is a space that is to be disrupted. And MOOCs, massive online open courses, are just touching the surface. Agreed, there's a lot of disruption in this space that stands to be happening. But what happens like, with this is, there's a huge talent pool. Now, tech career is actually becoming mainstream. Earlier, universities like Stanford, all, or all of these universities used to be the sources of the premium talent. But that's not the case anymore. You find people, 15-year-old kids, building awesome products, sitting right in their homes. This overall solves the problem of sourcing. Agreed, you have a lot of talent. But it poses a bigger problem of how do you assess them? How is a company looking to hire the great talent? You know that this is the person for me. And sadly, everybody wants the best. But how do you know who's really the best? Hacker Earth has developed proprietary algorithm and an assessment engine that does online and automatic evaluation of skills. So we're basically in the business of skill evaluation of, of candidates. And we do it in real time, and we do it in we do it automatically and in a scalable manner. So we assess the skills of candidates, and then we do an intelligent matching between the skill sets of a candidate to the requirements of a company. In the process, we are also opening up exciting job opportunities for candidates around the globe. In fact, recruiting uh, geographies are no longer a boundary in recruiting. There are companies based out of Valley hiring out of India, and vice versa too. And there are candidates all over the world and there are companies all over the world. It's becoming very murky, but it's becoming it's also becoming very difficult. It becomes it becomes a challenging task to recruit recruit well while you keep your costs low at the same time. It has been about five months since we launched and we are working with some of the top clients in India, companies like Inmobi, Capillary, SourceBits, Cleartrip and all. We have about twenty thousand pod programmers on a platform, about which we have assessed about five thousand of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you search them on internet, 
get their phone numbers and you start making calls. If the first business doesn't get you what you want, you make another call and then another call and you keep on doing that until you get what you want. So you see it's a painful process to get businesses on the phone. Not only it is time consuming, it is frustrating and difficult too. On the top of that, these businesses get your personal information and there's a great chance that they will spam your data. What have you done wrong? You just had one simple question and you should not have to suffer because of that. We won't let you. We are Ginger, a mobile messenger to send your query to more than one business at once and get quick response over chat. In short, send your query and get on with your day. So when you open Ginger, it looks just like your mobile messenger. You tap on new compose button and you can search for any business you want. So in this case, I search for a cafe in Saket, which is an Indian New Delhi. I get all the list, I get list of all the cafes in Saket, I select three of them. And I type in a query, say price of hot chocolate. Within few seconds, I start getting replies from Cafe Amici saying it's 110 rupees. I get a reply from Barista also. So I can even reply back to any of these restaurants and continue the chat, uh, just like any other mobile messenger. So you see with Ginger, you can communicate with more than one business at once at the same time. You need not remain occupied on the phone to receive answers. Also, you can choose the business you want to speak to and phone will never reveal your personal information so that you can never get spam. Now, how do we know that such a solution could work? There have been 250 billion mobile queries every year, out of which 50% have local intent. Now, even in a developing country like India, consumers spend 46% of their smartphone time online, out of which they spend more than half on chatting. So, there has been a behavioral shift in the psyche of the customers. They, so, we can uh, safely say that we are moving towards mobile chat. Now, uh, there are many players in the local space. How are we different? So most of the players in the local space are either a listing or discovery service, or they are an ordering and booking platform. While Ginger is trying to solve an entirely different problem here. We are enabling communication and transactions between customers and businesses, and this puts us quite in a unique position on the competitive landscape. Now to test our concept, we did a private beta in New Delhi. In one month and over 7,500 restaurants, we catered to around, around 1,200 customers who exchanged more than 5,000 messages uh, with the businesses. Apart from customers who used Ginger once or twice, there had been 15% customers who used Ginger multiple times. And this gives us confidence that once a customer gets hold of the concept, he uses Ginger every time he plans to go out. Now, uh, after our first prototype in November, we got incubated by GSF Accelerator in Gurgaon. And after that, after a few iterations and a private beta, now we are confident that we got the product right and now we are looking for a public launch. And eventually we are planning to move into other uh, other categories. Currently we are, we are looking for seed round financing. Uh, our team is a bunch of IIT Delhi dropouts <laughs> who are doing our second startup together. <laughs> so, our, so our earlier startup was uh, on the local space and so together we bring seven years of experience in local space and we are all set to pull this off. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Usually entrepreneurs write a business plan or something like that, 
And after that, I mean, it's a plan. So what, what you have to do? You have to execute a plan. Well, what happened is this. All of them fail. Actually, all of us fail, right? And we fail because no business plan survives fair contact, contact with customers. And actually, a business plan is a set of five hypotheses. So instead of executing it, what we have to do is actually to validate all these hypotheses. And also, a an startup is not the big version of a big company, or the small version of a big company. So we really need new tools and new ways to do these things. The good news is that we have Lean Startup uh, principles, customer development, all of these that help us as entrepreneurs a lot. So with this, entrepreneurs are able to fail less and to succeed faster. So by using these methodologies, we are able to do that. Okay, now you have to click a lot. <laughs> this is my very uh, quick story about uh, me as an entrepreneur. I studied computer science at the University of Granada. I did my PhD there as well. And in the second year of my degree, in 1999, I founded Buscar Amigos, which was my first internet company. And I sold this company two years after that. Uh, so it was a success. After that, I founded Ayactive after doing my PhD in artificial intelligence, which is my main company now. And um, this is a company specialized in artificial intelligence. In order to get more knowledge about business and so on, I, I did an MBA. I learned a lot, but actually I didn't learn what I was looking for. Well, so I came here to Singularity, this is true. I mean, a good knowledge, but not for a startup, or at least not all of them. I came to Singularity University looking for answers, and I started to learn more things about how to do innovation and so on. I co-founded three other companies. Um, these three are doing pretty well, actually. Nativus in Rio de Janeiro and so on. And after that, I started to coordinate the, the Lean Startup Circle here in San Jose Silicon Valley. So I started to learn all these methodologies that are helping me a lot. Now, I investing in, a, in some companies, only a little money, but I invest in, and after doing all of this, I have to say that having a startup is not cool. It's not cool at all, because having a startup is losing money every month, so this is not good. So it's not good to say, hey, I have a startup, this is not good, okay? So what we have to do is uh, transform our ideas and a startup into a profitable company. This is the reality, and this is what we really need to do, right? So in order to do that, we use Lean Startup Methodologies, which is a process to turn all these hypotheses into really facts, okay? Which is the problem, because there is a problem. I mean, there are a lot of books and so on, but this is like bat bat basketball. You don't know how to play basketball just by reading books, right? You really need to practice. So we, we need the basketball ball in order to practice all this. And the problem is that for lean startups, there are a lack of tools. And even there are some entrepreneurs that think that they have the knowledge, but they don't. So lean monitor is this tool, is the basketball ball, right? So lean monitor helps entrepreneurs to transform their startup and ideas into profitable companies by providing them the tools and also a personalized advice that is using our AI, artificial intelligence. So entrepreneurs know which is the next step after, after their, their business. And we are using a very good technology, our own technology, with a lot of awards and so on. We can go, oops, yes. Here you can see a, pic, a few pictures of the system. If you are interested in that, <coughs> let me know and I will uh, send you an access. And Lean Monitor is not just used by startups, also by accelerators, investors, because they are able actually to, to track all their startup progress, which is very good. We can go. And here you can see a screenshot of the accelerators. This is actually from Singularity University that they are using the, the system. Yes, we are close. So, no, oh, sorry. <laughs> Two before. <coughs> the, it's actually the, the last one. No. Sorry. <laughs> So our milestones so, so far are, we have 10, we started a few months ago actually, but we already have 10 happy accelerators and, and universities using the system, and more than 150 uh, startups that are better. This is the important thing, they are better. So these are our milestones, that they are better because us, right? So at the end, 
if you remember this little seed, what we want to do is this big tree in order to really help the world, the world to be a better place. So if you really want to contact me or whatever, if you are an accelerator, an entrepreneur or whatever, uh, please write down this contact detail because I have to run now. So I'm not going to have a lot of time to be here. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I can really advise you to use the system, I've been through it. Um, thanks for letting me be here. I lived in India for a couple of years in, in, in Mumbai and Hyderabad, so everything that was spoken here speaks a lot to me. After India, I moved to Nigeria and I spent the last four years investing in microfinance banks in Nigeria. Um, and I came to Singularity uh, last summer, and the first thing that um, the last thing that I saw in Nigeria before I left was a plane crash. 160 people died, and I was speaking about it as you do at the yacht club in uh, Lagos. And um, eventually, this wall is it not recognizing? I uh, just keep on trying. Um, and uh, what I what, re what I realized is that it takes three to five working days to get a spare part into the country. So at a four hundred thousand dollar downtime cost, and these costs go up, right? It goes up to one point two million dollars. That is a huge incentive to bribe somebody to keep the plane flying, even though you know it's broken, right? So I came to Singularity, and I learned about a, a bunch of other uh, global grand challenges, and I learned about other technology solutions that had no application in this field. And I'm like. 3D printing, supply chain uh, failings, we have, to, we have to sort this out. So I started thinking about what we could do to sort things out. And that, that's a nice picture. And I realized that you know, on the technology side, there's already really smart people dealing with a lot of problems. Um, I was at Lawrence Livermore the other day. They're printing down to one micron layers. I mean, completely imperceptible to the human eye. They're printing gold, silver, titanium, steel. They're printing glass, printing sand. I don't know what they're doing with that. Um, and, and so the technology piece is sorted out, but what I realized is that the IP piece isn't. So if you're Boeing and you want to pr produce your spare part in, Ni in Nigeria for immediate installation into one of your planes, then you're not going to share it with some guy, a doofus in, in Nigeria who's got a 3D printer, right? So the whole plane story really scares people and I've been told I sand it, a bunch of other people to take it out. I like it, it's why I started this business, um, but it's 15, 20 years away, right? But the, the basic problem still remains. You've got a design owner who wants to print something on a, on a 3D printer, and he has no way of getting there except for sending the actual raw design file, okay? Which you can then take and send to all your friends, produce a billion times, send to somebody in China to reproduce uh, a thousand times over, and and so you're losing out on potential revenue. Um, uh, that's, this is me. I have a tech guy that uh, doesn't like photos. Um, next. <laughs> Um, so, so just to speak to your to the supply chain problem a bit more, I mean, once I start thinking about this problem, it's really massive. It really sucks. Supply chains are hugely expensive. They are really inflexible. If you want a product, you have to order it months in advance before it gets through the shipping. And it, my, my fiancé sent her stuff from D.C. to Lagos. It took three and a half months to arrive. I mean, this is what products do, right? They sit at ports. In Nigeria, an ice cream company has gone, gone out of business because Every flavor except for chocolate is stuck in the port. They can't get it out, right? So supply chains are a massive issue. Um, and, and 3D printing can help us overcome that. There's initial applications are maybe critical spare parts for really valuable installations. Oil rigs cost 800 to two, 800,000 to $2 million to keep down per day. So there's a really big incentive to get the part there faster. Next. So what we offer, um, is a system that easily transfers a file from one from the design owner to um, the 3D printer. But that's only part of it. We've seen DRM not really work in a, a lot of different fields. What we do in addition to that is we, we, we deal with another piece that other people have completely forgotten about. If Boeing sends a design to a 3D printer, then what, what is, is Boeing really going to accept that piece to be installed? They didn't know what happened on the ground there when it was being printed. Maybe somebody kicked the machine while it was being, you know, uh, used. So no, I'm sorry. Um, so one of the one other thing that I'm quite proud of is um, generating cloud-based uh, qualitative and um, uh, QA and liability management, which means the machine feeds us a lot of data. We compare it to the data that we expect the machine to produce. Okay, and and can can 
put a pretty significant QA together depending on data. Authentication, we are actually pulling, embedding watermarks in physical objects at this point. Um, so that means every, every piece that's being produced has a unique signature that is imperceptible to the human eye that I can scan, the Boeing engineer can scan before he's installing it into the, into the machine. And crowdsourcing, 3D printers are still hugely complicated. If you've tried one, it takes 130 different settings just to get the file that the 3D printer understands. That's ridiculous. So what we do is we crowdsource those settings, we understand what have you used, what has that guy used over there that's worked, and we, we suggest it to somebody else trying to do the same thing. So that's what we're doing. We, this, is, this is more than just DRM. This is really exciting, high math stuff that I don't really understand. Yeah, sorry, I'm going on. Big market, um, in our advisors say in 15 years, 10% of manufacturing will be 3D printed. That's six and a half trillion dollars. Next. Um, and there's a bunch of other people working on, on these solutions. We go from the very closed wall uh, <coughs> systems. This guy actually wants to, Intellectual Ventures has a patent to embed a chip in a machine into, into a 3D printer that actually checks for the design authenticity before it's allowed to be printed. That means every print that's being printed on that 3D printer has to be checked before it's being, being enough. I spent two million dollars on a printer and then suddenly I'm not allowed to use it for what I want to use it for. I don't think people would accept that. So what we are doing is we're, we're placing ourselves firmly in the middle where we are acceptable to the to, to general consumers, but at the same time, we are allowing um, people, we, we, we are giving the kind of safety to designers that they want. That's the next. There's a bunch of other competitive advantages. Next. Um, our first product is SendShapes.com. It'll be out in a couple months. Um, essentially, we, we're just stripping out all the payment gateway and stuff, and we're just securing the, the streamed um, uh, designs into the printer. Also, uh, listening to some of the echoes and, and, and starting that QA. It's quite exciting stuff. Had a whole bunch more challenges than I thought there would be. Sounds simple, isn't it? Okay, next. Um, <coughs> it looks like this, very simple. This is, this is advertising space. This is the only interaction that you actually uh, have to deal with. So really, really simple for people to use. This, uh, remember again, the only current alternative is to send the actual file, the actual design file. This is, this is simple and new at the same time. Next. And that's it. Thanks, thanks a lot for the time. Thank Thanks. You. App developers build better performant apps. Uh, we as customers, we all love our phones and apps, but we hate it when the apps perform badly. Right? When they drain your battery, when they take too much of a data plan, or when they crash very often, it's a huge pain. And there are like a lot of surveys which say like 44 percent, everybody is unhappy when apps app, uh, app are not performing, but it, people tend to uninstall apps just because it badly performs. Right? It's a very bad one. And as and as mobile, de mobile devices are inherently are limited capacity devices. As app developers are the big bottom, you can't just use it. And this is not just limited to bad apps, even the good apps. The Google Plus, the Facebook, the Google Currents, everybody has the same problem. If you go to the forum, people are just complaining about them all over the place. What do you do? And then that's where like as app developers, there are like not good tools out there to actually help you fix these leaks. There are tools like post-production tools, but they're not enough good tools out there to actually analyze them and fix them. That's where we come in. Little I wants to be the Julian Assange to help you fix your leaks. Right? That's what our primary job is. So we are a pre-production performance analysis and monitoring tool. That's what Little I is. So it's extremely easy to use. It's, it's a desktop software which works in a Mac, Windows, and Linux, place where actually the app developers and testers actually work on. It's, you just download it, start it up, connect your phone. Sorry, connect your phone, see all the apps that is on the phone, select your app which you want to profile, boom, just go. In, in five minutes, you're actually able to start and monitor your app in real time. That's the thing. It's like we like to call it a ridiculous easy to use, but awesomely powerful performance analysis tool. So there are three things that we really like about what we have done. The first thing is what we call the visual correlation engine. Right? Typically, when you get all these profiling tools, the big challenge is you get a lot of data. But what do you do with those data? It's very hard to actually use the data. But that's where we come in. We do this thing called correlation. We actually collect what the video, what the user was actually doing, but collecting all the screenshots and putting it together as a video. We collect a lot of events around the app, what the app was doing, what the user was what the system was doing, everything is all connected. 
I'm showing to you in a single correlated view what's called the visual correlation. And we tell you things like data, power, memory, all the consumption in real time. You see it right there. And it's all recordable, playback. You can just play everything and do it on the phone. That's the first thing. The second thing that we do is reports. We do the automated insights report where we actually can tell you what is wrong. A tool should not just collect data and it's up to you. It will actually tell you, look, at this point of time, you actually went and did this thing wrong. Why don't you go change it? It's kind of giving you a lot of insights, automated insights. And also working on building what is called a performance code. So you actually use it to compare your app with your competitive app and see where exactly are you. And the third and the most coolest thing is this. Zero setup, zero coding, zero instance. Just download, start connecting and boom. Like most of our customers are actually, that's what they really like. In half an hour of their usage of our tool, they've actually understood things about the app which they never really understood before. Right? That's like really awesome thing. Let's see. So this is the market is reached to the market. Like there are like, this is, I don't have to say, like, there are two million apps out there in the app store. There are like, more than a quarter million and growing at 100% rate per year. This is actually last year's data going on. And this is just App Store data. And there are enterprise developers. All the enterprises are actually getting into apps and then building apps. That's, that's it. So the market is pretty big. And then it's a subscription based. How is our business model? It's, we build it as a subscription based tool. It's per developer license. And then we actually have a good, uh, what is called, volume, not something, uh, floating license. So you don't have to per, per user, but you can actually buy and then install multiple. And then, but only one day can be activated in one time. It's a, we have a full day that we try, and it's a monthly or annual license. That's what we do. Uh, where are we so far? Like we just launched our app two weeks back. We had a very fairly successful beta program. Uh, more than two thirds of our research is outside India. Uh, we have around 40 odd countries, developers from 40 odd countries actually using our product right now. And we have also been selected for Google I.O. We did a demo to them. They really liked it. We have been shortlisted for Google I.O. Quickly about the team. Uh, we are a bunch of five program analysis geeks. We have worked on, unlike what Naveen said, even though we are relatively experts in the same domain and actually writing building startup in the same domain. Because we think we have done a lot of bad things in our previous work, building complex, hard to use developer tools. We thought we'll, we'll erase all our sins by building these cool tools right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, uh, so that's what we are, a like, bunch of guys, and then we have, uh, yeah, that's, okay. That's, that's what we're doing. Thank you. change of pace before we continue with the other pitches. We um, had a surprise visit from Dave McClure, one of our partners and head of 500 startups here uh, in the Valley. And he will be joining Naval Ravikant, the co-maintainer and co-founder of Angelus, in a discussion with Rajesh. So this is an exciting opportunity, I think a unique dialogue. So um, I, I've been watching Dave So it's truly, a <laughs> it's truly a dialogue. So the two of them, please come up. Where are you guys? And Dave. Okay. Dave will be juggling and I'll be doing the swords. I dressed up just for him. <laughs> That's pretty dressed up for you. Are <laughs> uh, we also doing better pictures? No, go ahead. He'll yep, prod you. Oh, okay, you'll you prod us in case yeah. we get boring. <laughs> So Naval, I know you've spent many years honing your craft here in Silicon Valley. Uh, tell us how you started from a small mud hut in Africa to the place you are now in, in your stature in life. Yeah, uh, so my stature is not that large, I'm going to go And uh, you know, like most of you, I'm an entrepreneur and I don't think I've made it in any sense of the word. I get to get through a camera, but you know, that's the thing about Silicon Valley. There's always people 10x as successful as you. And, People who are going to be 10 x as well as you, those are the two categories as far as I'm concerned. And so it has a way of keeping you in your toes. Um, I am of Indian origin. I was born in India. I grew up there until I was nine, moved here with my family in uh, 83. Um, and, you know, it's fun to have those uh, memories in your head of, like, you know, wandering outside your grandmother's house barefoot and, like, chasing the guy with, like, the cow and he's got the food and the poverty <laughs> shot and then, like, being here, right? It's, and walking around Stanford campus and, and being in the halls of power and privilege and, and watching what goes on. It's, it's really important to have that perspective in life. Um, and I think it's important because if you want to do well in this business or this career, um, by definition, you're working with the smartest people in the world. Um, so the, it's a meritocracy in the long run. It may not be the short run, but trust me, it's a meritocracy in the long run. Um, and you have to stay humble, you have to stay learning, and you have to keep moving. Um, so the best people I know in the Valley never run out of energy. And if you meet somebody right now who is a nobody, and they're really smart and really passionate and really hardworking, believe me, they will be a somebody someday. That's, that's what's great about Silicon Valley. It may not be tomorrow, but it, it will be 10 years from now. 
Some of us take 25 years. To, uh, yeah, we're, we're late bloomers. <laughs> you know, they start younger and younger and younger. It's, it's pretty crazy. The 17 year old kid sold his company to Yahoo now. Uh, yeah, he's, he's probably worth more than two of us uh, put together. To yeah. in, uh, very, uh, yes. Payments company That's right. 21. Summarized. Yeah. Right. Uh, I share that story a little bit, except my uh, third world country was West Virginia. Not, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so you came from a poorer part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But you know what's ironic is, uh, at this point, India is the future, right? And, and yeah. all of us who are sitting here know that. The first world is facing is stagnating to some extent. Don't tweet this out because I don't want to get the flame. Right? <laughs> yeah, Street Journal, but uh, the developed countries have had their run, uh, and uh, a lot of the innovation, a lot of the growth is happening in the developing countries. And over there, it looks to you right now maybe that you're playing in the in the minor leagues, but you're actually playing in the majors. Um, by the time you think you're playing in the majors, they're back to being the minors. It's just the way this whole industry I, I works. So I've been to India for the first time just uh, less than two years ago, but five times in the last two years. Yeah. Uh, and I started the company in the mid-90s with some folks from South India here, so I've sort of had a long courtship with India, but a very recent sort of consummation, shall we say. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll end up back in India in the long run, and I never yeah. thought I would have said that like you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's a, it's a combination of, of, of course, culture, but also opportunity. You know, fundamentally, uh, most of the people in this room are innovators. If this was 17th century, uh, you know, we'd be in Italy. Or if this was, you know, 6th century, we'd be in Greece. So we would find our way to wherever the frontier is. Um, and the frontier is currently in Silicon Valley, but it's expanding out to the internet. Um, and then it's going to coalesce where the markets are. And the markets in China are in, in China and India. And China, I just don't understand. Like, <laughs> I've been there, and it makes zero sense to me. Um, probably makes sense to people who speak Chinese. Um, but it, you know, India makes a lot of sense, and, and it's going to be an amazing amount of innovation. So I'm looking forward to to reengaging there. Right now, I'm stuck in age of this in the cloud. But, uh, you know, I think you know, issue. at least from the recent trips to India, there's often I think a lot of people worshiping Silicon Valley, and maybe not appropriately in many ways. I think a lot of tremendous opportunity, like you say, is the next decade in India, and really as much or more on the domestic India market as maybe the, the global market. Well, India's already done this before, which is, uh, it's got uh, Bollywood, which yeah. in some sense, you know, Hollywood now looks like the Bollywood. Uh, you know, if I go to, I know I'm at a cool party when they put on the Bhangra remix. <laughs> 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 uh, and it's kind of funny watching sort of all the non-Indians go out there. <laughs> uh, so I think India can, or can yeah, I think India can create markets outside of just India. And I think just looking at purely internal <coughs> Indian stuff is, is limiting yourself. Now that's, that's a low hanging fruit, of course. Right. Um, but uh, India has the benefit, um, you know, whatever you may think about it, it, it historically, India has the benefit of being in the Anglosphere. Right. Um, and so that means that it gives us a very powerful weapon where we can take this gigantic market that can plug in API-wise into the Anglosphere when it needs, but also be its own market, so have its own domestic creation. A little bit of language slash GDP arbitrage opportunity with Absolutely, uh, yeah. India that I think is interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe how you, I want to get to Angelus, but yeah. what was your uh, <laughs> teenage years in Silicon Valley, shall we say, in the last decade? Uh, you spent time building uh, Epinion, building Bass, being an angel investor. Um, how did those experiences and maybe a little venture hacks kind of bring you to today? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can plan your life looking forward, right? As Steve Jobs said this very famously at his commencement speech that he gave here, but you can, you, when you look back, you can connect the dots and you see the pattern, it makes sense. But the forward planning is sort of a waste of time. And, and I tried to do a lot of that, actually, because we are, we're all goal-driven people. Um, and I would have been better off just uh, probably saying, okay, I just want to work around the smartest people, the most trustworthy people, the most hardworking people, mm -hmm. kind of those three characteristics. Um, and as long as I'm around them, it'll work out in the end. And I think that would have been probably a better model than what I was trying to plot and plan. Um, to give you an example, you know, in 2007, I decided I wanted to be in the, in the venture business. Um, and like you, I chose the better brand name, which was Super Angel. So I raised a small fund and I ran around investing. I did pretty well. I invested in Twitter and Foursquare and Uber and a couple others. That, that would probably be more than yeah. pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's most of the returns still in the future. Let's see what happens. But you know, it, it was a reasonable set of outcomes. And uh, just today, I actually went to my limited partners, my meeting before this, and I announced them that I will not be raising a second fund. Um, 
And uh, I could do that, and I could go out and continue to do that, but what I realized is my passion is angel listing. And I've been plotting and connecting the dots forward, saying I'm going to be in the venture capital business, therefore I'll do a small fund, do well, then I'll do a big fund, and so on. But when I get to the opportunity to do the big fund, I realize I don't want it. Because this thing that I've been hacking on the side that turned into a phenomenon is really what I'm passionate about. Um, so, you know, so I'm committed to AngelList, and, and that only emerges from you as you just do what you love with people you like, as opposed to what you think you should be doing. If you feel uncomfortable doing something, like you're meeting with someone, you don't really, you're doing it out of obligation, or if you, you're doing something because your parents want you to, or so on, you're probably headed down the wrong path. You have to course correct later in life when it's, like, it's a lot more expensive. Um, so I would say that that's a primary learning. Um, and, and for most of us who have been here for a while, like you can tell when someone's really successful in Silicon Valley because they're dressed like a slob. They're not trying to impress anyone with anything. They're, they're completely comfortable being who they are, right? So in that sense, the fact that I'm even wearing a jacket is a bit of a put on, right? Um, so I think you just really have to be comfortable in your own skin before you can discover what you're meant to do, and that's what you're going to be amazing at. That's what you're going to be the best in the world at. Um, I, I know that no one's ever going to displace me from, stop me from doing AngelList or, or beat me in any sense because I'm just being me. And who's going to be better me than me? Um, and if I fail, or, or it'll be because I set some goal for myself that's orthogonal to who I am. Um, so I just think it's, it's very important to discover what you want to be, and the best way to do that is to sort of cast aside all these things that other people want you to be. In society, you know, other people are really good at pressuring you that like, you ought to go to this kind of school, you ought to study this. A lot of people end up on the trap of like, you ought to be an entrepreneur or you ought to be a venture capitalist. Not everybody should want to be an entrepreneur. If you really want to be, go be it. And then fundraising is secondary, right? If fu funding is just a tool that sometimes you need, many times you don't. Um, so I know this all sounds very fuzzy and vague, but uh, I, I think especially in the culture, you get pressured a lot to be a certain way. And the beauty of Stanford is, I mean, you look around this campus, right? This is like, like, these kids have the best life on the planet, right? They're sitting out there, they have the best weather, they're surrounded the smartest people, they have their youth, they obviously have some degree of money because they're here, they have opportunity for the future, they have everything handed to them on a silver platter. And you know what, and they're so relaxed. And their success rate is incredibly high. And I know growing up in India, you know, where you look around, like, if you don't produce, you starve, right? It's, it's a very, it's a, in that sense, it is very third world, but it's improving. And so it builds this like, crazy self-pressure and drive into you. Um, and that can take you the wrong way many times because people will tell you, well, okay, then you must go to school and you must do this, you must get that checklist. And it's okay to wander. It's okay to dress like Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's a good friend. I, I would hardly agree with you. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are some people who follow a very top-line, goal-directed path, and that's a short the uh, line to success, but I would say my, my path has been definitely very meandering. Uh, I started out as an engineer, I sort of fell into entrepreneurship, uh, which had a lot of positives and negatives. And then I kind of figured out after more than 10 years being out of undergraduate school that hey, this MBA thing might be what I should be doing next. And uh, applied to Stanford, failed to get in, unfortunately had to settle for uh, spending three years at PayPal, which turned out to be an awesome alternative to an MBA, <laughs> uh, and possibly even better uh, experience. Um, but I, I don't think, think you'd be up here if you'd gotten that MBA. Uh, maybe. I mean, I, maybe I, eventually. I, I think there's a lot of benefits yeah. to maybe getting in the top 10 yeah. uh, MBA programs, or maybe top 20, but I think it falls off quite quickly after that. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot of different paths to success. One is you know, getting a job at a big startup, uh, or a big platform company that's got some juice. And then another one is being successful at running your own startup. Uh, and another one is failing at your own startup. I actually think there's a lot to be learned from that experience uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think success comes from habits, not from uh, specific actions that you take. Yes, we, we're, we, this is a lottery ticket environment. So you know, we, we all know someone who sort of joined the right company at the right time. And, looks like from the outside like they made a lot of money. What we don't realize is from the that's easy from the outside, but from the inside, a lot of times they wouldn't have had that opportunity to join that company, nor would they have been accepted, nor would they have recognized it, nor, nor would they have been able to exploit it had they not built up the right set of habits over their career. Um, and once you have kind of the right habits, you, you also, uh, you know, you can just be consistent. 
uh, and it's a long game. Warren Buffett is the richest self-made guy in the world uh, because he has... He has